opening plenary is called Liberal Democracy in Crisis. And so I'm gonna introduce the prompt that we sent to our speakers here today. Since the election of Donald Trump as President of the United States in 2016, many on the left perceive liberal democracy to be in crisis. Trump, Brexit, and the rise of new populist parties and authoritarian regimes around the world have been regarded as a global quote-unquote threat to democracy. The election of Biden in 2020 was largely felt as a relief or was accepted as a lesser evil. However, after three years, many of the discontents with so-called liberal democracy remain. With the return of Trump as a strong contender for re-election in the upcoming US election, the Platypus Affiliated Society now asks, what does liberal democracy mean for the left? How is it useful for understanding the capitalist state? And if not, why? Where does the term liberal democracy come from historically? What did Marx and Engels mean when they said that the working class needs to fight, that needs to win the battle of democracy? Is there still a battle of democracy to win? Is liberal democracy in crisis today? If so, how? If not, why? What would it mean for the left to defend or to oppose or to overcome liberal democracy? And lastly, how have different generations, the new left, the millennial left, and young leftists today, the so-called so Zoomer left, try to grapple with the problem of liberal democracy? What, if any, are the lessons to learn from the previous generation on the left? Now I'm going to introduce the speakers in the order that they will be speaking, um, starting from the far right there. Um, we have Jordan Deanda, he is an activist uh, at the, at, is, is the education chair for, of the organization For the People, Chicago, uh, which is a revolutionary communist organization whose mission statement is to develop a broad communist movement in America through both material and ideological intervention in local political struggle. For the people's current body of work includes working tenant unions, national liberation organizations, leftist student groups, community-based political action committees, running survival programs, and hopefully, in the near future, workers' organizations. Next, we have Matt McManus, who is a lecturer in political science at the University of Michigan and the author of The Political Right and Equality and the forthcoming book, The Political Theory of Liberal Socialism, amongst other books. Next, we have Ralph Leonard, who is a British-Nigerian writer based in England. His work has appeared in Unheard, Sublation Magazine, Aerial Magazine, Quillette, and elsewhere. And lastly, we have Chris Patron. Chris is the last Marxist. He teaches, he teaches critical theory at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and at the Institute for Clinical Social Work. Now, just quickly before I begin, I just want to remind everyone of the format of the panel. So each panelist is going to have seven to eight minutes for uh, to present their opening remarks. You should introduce Howie to the key here. Howie's arrived. He won't be. He won't be. I don't know. He's no, no, he's arrived. He's a founder. Yeah, you how many minutes? Uh, We've already waited. No, okay. go ahead. Um, so again, each panelist is going to have seven to eight minutes to uh, introduce their, their opening remarks, and then we're going to follow um, their opening remarks with a round of responses, where each will have, let's try and have three to four minutes of response to each other. And after this round of responses, we'll follow with uh, the Q&A. So with that being said, um, Jordan, you have the floor. Somebody me yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Your turn, this one. Yeah, I got this. Got yep. Hello, hello. Is it? 
Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jordan. Please forgive me. I may have overrode from my opening remarks. Uh, but let's see how much I get through this, right? Uh, one, what's liberal democracy mean for the left, and how is it useful for understanding the capitalist state? So-called liberal democracy, which is better understood through the label bourgeois democracy, is, for us in the United States and more other imperialist countries, the economic, political, and ideological arena in which our political struggles with capitalism are taking place. Bourgeois democracy is not simply an idea or an ideology that can simply be argued against. It is not a singular policy that singular laws or reforms can do away with. In reality, it encompasses our total political life, meaning the material system and infrastructure for the production and distribution of our society's economic wealth, which in turn is the base for how all bourgeois political power, bourgeois political philosophy, and the bourgeois democratic state is generated. Laws are not political power. Ideas are not political power. Political offices are not the real political power. These facets simply describe and enforce the will of those who have the real political power, the economic power, the means of production. The term, term bourgeois democracy helps us on the left understand that our political state is not class neutral and is in reality a state made only to serve and protect the interests of one class, the bourgeoisie, as well as the mode of production that is the source of their power, capitalism. For those of us who are not a part of the bourgeois class, Bourgeois liberal democracy is generally only as democratic as the system of, of capitalism that it stems from. What the class nature of our state means for the left is that loose, amorphous, class-neutral concepts like the left, like leftism, like progressivism, can no longer serve positive political development and in fact obscure the class lines in which our society is built upon, the class lines that real political changes are organized upon. Class neutral terminology is idealist in nature because it allows us to reduce everything exclusively to the realm of ideas and of argument and makes the realm of reality secondary, if not irrelevant, rather than primary. Idealism encourages us all to believe a person's true politics can be reduced to simply agreeing or disagreeing with a set of ideas labeled as left wing and compels us to ignore the person's actual material place within the system that they are only asked to critique rather than concretely organize against. It is true that vague concepts like leftism have in our modern times, as they always have, umbrella together right wing reformists with left wing revolutionaries. Leftism lumps together the anti-monopoly small business owner with his undocumented employee from a colonized nation. Leftism includes both the DSA Democrat voters and the Black Panthers. It includes both a northern industrialist who is looking to underpay emancipated black men together with a black woman who struggles violently to end her enslavement. Concepts like leftism lump together National socialists who want a Swedish style of socialism with the revolutionary unionists at a Bangladeshi Asian factory. These are both apparently leftists. By some standards, leftism even includes socially progressive Zionists with communist forces participating in the armed struggle. Class bond concept of the left uh, shows us that many political groups or many political groups and political tendencies tendencies that consider the left to be the key base of political action or the motive force in desired political change uh, are why many methods and tactics employed by the sweeping majority of the left have done little or nothing to help us escape from the basic flaws of bourgeois democracy. The true bourgeois nature of liberal democracy demands that we forget the left and its vague concepts and start focusing on class, giving primacy to class, specifically the class whose material interests are opposed to that of the bourgeoisie, and the classes who are in a concrete position to express some leverage over the enemy classes. Some members of these enemy classes claim to be leftists, by the way. To ignore class is to ignore reality, and the language built into the premise of this question encourages us to continue pretending we are all on the same side, that we all have the same vested interests, that we all have the same goals, which is to continue to ignore reality. Two, where does the term liberal democracy come from historically? Liberal, real, liberalism and liberal democracy as a concept comes from the transitionary period between capitalism and feudalism. 
For much of the last 1,000 years, feudal models of production and government, governance ruled most of society and encouraged a range of political ideas, such as the fundamental inequality between the rulers and the ruled, the royal's God-given right to political power, state religions, restrictions of speech, and other such ideas that represented and rationalized the political system. The ability for these ideas to triumph and govern society was based solely in the fact that the feudal model of production, the lord and serf model, was the dominant economic model in each nation that practiced feudalism. However, as methods of mass production began to improve, especially after the Industrial Revolution, the merchant class, which had been a middle class up until that point, began to become more powerful and evolve into the capitalist class. Eventually, capitalism, the wage worker and business owner system, overtook feudalism in its economic might, and the capitalist class gradually did away with feudalism across the world and became our new ruling class. To reflect the change in this class power and politically rationalize the new system, the revolutionary capitalists of that era promoted ideas of liberalism, which, in contrast to feudal ideas, included freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the equality of all men before God, human rights, vicious individualism, the rights of private property, and the capitalist right to a democracy. This transition in history is where the concept of bourgeois liberal democracy come, comes from. Is it just a reflection of the economic model and the overall class outlook of the capitalists in the rebuke of feudalism? Despite liberalism being globally, a globally dominant ideology, as capitalism continues to degenerate, it becomes increase, increasingly clear that a growing section of the bourgeoisie does not, or cannot, continue to believe in even the basics of liberal democratic ideas. The truth, this truth also demands that the working class claim its role in bringing human society to a better stage by rebuking capitalist philosophy and developing a new revolutionary socialist philosophy of its own. So what did Marx and Engels mean when they said the working class has to win the battle of democracy? The quote is exactly, we have seen above that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of the ruling class. Sorry, the uh, first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of the ruling class, to win the battle of democracy. And this is from the manifesto. To me, it is very cut and dry. Marx and Engels were communists. They were scientific socialists, dialectical materialists. To approach, que approach questions of human society uh, and how capitalism functions with such a framework is to decisively conclude, as they famously did, that reformism is a road to nowhere for those of us who are interested in realizing an actual democratic system. For the proletariat to become the ruling class is to achieve the true definition of socialism, meaning a full-blown socialist revolution, wherein the working class forms a proletarian state that is required to fully dismantle and capitalism and private ownership of the means of production. This pro the proletarian class under socialism will organize itself into a democracy and work to crush undemocratic elements remaining in their society, i.e. capitalism and privately hoarded wealth. And when capitalism is fully eroded, when human exploitation is fully eradicated, when political power is collectivized through the collectivization of economic power, that is to say, when class conflict no longer exists, then we will have achieved a true human democracy. Is liberal democracy in crisis today? If so, how? If not, why not? Uh, liberal democracy is indeed in crisis. This is not a new crisis. It is not an unforeseeable crisis. The domestic and global instability we are experiencing are deeply tied to the fundamental flaws in the capitalist mode of production. They did not start with Trump, or Reagan for that matter, but instead are a simple reflection of the latent effects of monopolization, a process at the very core of a capitalist economy's logic which continues to transform capitalist competition for business into imperialist conflicts for resources, for cheap labor, and for military domination over competing sectors of the world. The boom-bust cycle of capitalist production, crises of overproduction, the unrestricted abuse we endure, endure from finance capital and their constantly bursting bubbles are all fundamental aspects of our current stage of capitalist society. The decay of our increasingly privatized institutions, the decay of federally constituted norms and rights, the increasingly divided domestic bourgeoisie, the declining 
economic hegemony, hegemony of the American dollar, escalating wars and tensions between the imperialist powers of the world, the construction of concentration camps to hold refugees fleeing their native countries destroyed by American imperialism, the weaving of undocumented and child labor into the basic fabric of, the, of our nation's economy, the construction of cop cities across America as the bourgeoisie attempts to prepare its police force for a domestic armed struggle, rising socialist and revolutionary sentiment, rising fascist sentiment embodied by people like Trump, and the most vicious sections of the bourgeoisie consolidating themselves into distinct imperialist camps, which, and you ask me, that is what Brexit is, right, is part and parcel of a global economic system based upon unlimited economic growth on a planet with chillingly, economic, uh, chillingly limited resources. This supposed crisis of liberal democracy is nothing more than the foreseeable consequences of capitalism. These critiques of capitalism I am describing are all well over a century old, and the methods of resistance practiced by those who make these critiques often look nothing like what is so commonly prescribed and practiced by the left. The foundational flaws of capitalism quite obviously cannot be resolved within the bounds of a capitalist mode of production, and the major challenges we face today cannot be resolved within the bounds of anything considered liberal. Five, how have the different generations of the new left, the millennial left, and young leftists, and so-called Zoomer left tried to grapple with the problem of liberal democracy? What if, what if any, are the lessons to learn from previous generations? So, for the sake of time, I'm gonna keep this section especially short and focus solely on the most notable communist forces in America, right? The Communist Party USA teaches us that black liberation is a central aspect to revolutionary America, that alliances cannot be made with the bourgeois parties, that reformists have measures like the New Deal exist only to destroy a revolutionary movement, and that we must crush revisionism within our organizations at all costs. The Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army shows us that we must serve the interests of the people to win their hearts and support, that the struggles of the people on the day-to-day -day drive the course of struggle for revolution, and that, uh, and that, this, uh, that such support is the success, it is the lifeblood of a revolutionary movement. It shows us that armed struggle is a decisive aspect of political revolution, and that while we must have above-ground organizations, the true revolu revolutionary party must be clandestine. I'm wrapping up right now, I apologize. The Revolutionary Communist Party shows us that the need for decisive ideological debate and ideological clarity to unify the movement, it shows us that we must take up the responsibility of developing Marxism further, and that the labor struggle cannot be neglected, the struggle for queer liberation cannot be neglected, and the result of this and many other things, the RCP teaches us the consequences of losing the support of the masses and of cultish, cultish revisionism. And as for the modern day, every passing moment, we learn from the newest generation of the left, and the lessons of these decades will be studied for decades on. One thing I can say now is the quote unquote Zoomer left lays bare the consequences of ideological and historical illiteracy and our inability to defeat anarchist and postmodernist worldviews, our inability to even acknowledge labor as an essential arena of struggle, our inability to centralize the role of class, and our inability to reject the nonprofit industrial complex as a supposed vehicle for meaningful change. And in conclusion, I would say that the majority of the world's true progressive forces, the revolutionary anti-capitalists, ideological development, rectification, and organizational consolidation are the key tasks. On this front, we in FTP Chicago say that Marxism, Leninism, Maoism is the highest stage of communist ideology today. It is not a formula, it is not a dogma, but it is the new foundation for which we will build a revolutionary movement. It is, it, and developing parity with the revolutionary Maoist parties across the world through developing our own, while likely far off, is the ultimate goal for those of us who grasp the full scope of what liberal democracy is and how it is resisted. Who's next? Oh, it is me. Okay, cool. Well, Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate you having me here today. Uh, so my comments uh, are gonna be relatively brief since I'm sure many of you uh, are more keen on getting into questions and it's gonna focus on what if anything uh, liberalism should mean for the contemporary left today. So my argument is that for the left, liberalism uh, going way, way back has always been thought of with a mixture of admiration and disdain. On the one hand, virtually every Marxist thinker worth their salt 
would admit that liberalism served a historically important ideological purpose in routing the aristocratic philosophies of the Ancien Regime. And this is very clear in Marx's early work especially. Uh, these have never entirely gone away, as we've seen with the resurrection of authoritarian thought in the 21st century. And you know, we can go through the list between uh, Bronze Age pervert to Curtis Yarvin to all the neo-reactionaries out there uh, if you want. Uh, however, there is no denying uh, from a socialist perspective that liberalism assumed for itself a high degree of prestige as a result of this victory against reactionary forces. Now, why should we understand liberalism this way? The radicalism of liberalism lay, I would argue, in no small part in its incipient uh, egalitarianism. And it's very important to take note of just how transformative uh, this commitment to human equality is. As Leo Strauss, the famous conservative thinker, noted in his book, The City and Man, pre-liberal philosophies were almost ubiquitously anti-egalitarian in a very strong sense. They took them, they for granted the inequalities between people and mapped that onto what Charles Taylor calls a social ontology predicated on hierarchical complementarity. The idea being that society is fundamentally a pyramid with people at the bottom, a very few people at the top, and while it's obviously very clear that the people at the top need the people at the bottom, that by no means implies that the people at the top possess anywhere near the same responsibilities as the people at the bottom, as the people at the bottom, or that the people at the bottom are entitled to anywhere near the political power status as the people at the top. Proto-liberal thinkers like Hobbes and Locke challenge this uh, by insisting on the fundamental equality of all human beings, whether as a matter of natural fact in Locke or as a matter of natural right in Locke. This equality was, of course, highly qualified for many liberals, as the Marxist Domenico Lucero notes up for us, but it was still constituted a gigantic ideological leap forward for the cause of equality around the globe and helped inspire many of the revolutions that broke out between the 18th and the 19th century that of course probably divided a template uh, for the revolutionary theories of Marxism going forward. On the other hand, there is no denying, as my comrade noted, uh, that there is no doubt a highly reactionary side to liberalism. In fact, I would argue an even more reactionary side to liberalism than what antecedent it. Antiquarian and medieval thinkers tended to find models of hierarchical complementarity, yes, but they also accepted, indeed, emphasized that the upper orders had a kind of noblesse oblige towards those below. There was a sense in which inequality between social orders was naturalized or supplemented in a beneficent way. They argued that nature, that nature is just fundamentally unequal or God ordains inequality. But this means that the poor are to be shown compassion and even a kind of paternalistic sympathy by the higher orders. And you can see this in many of the classics of reactionary thought going through to the present day. One preeminent example uh, early in the liberal era is Robert Filmer's De Patriarcha, that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, essentially an argument for a fundamentally patriarchal mode of government centered around a king as the father of his family looking after his children, the citizens. By contrast, while early liberal thinkers all argued that human beings are fundamentally equal as a matter of nature or principle, they also insisted that people do not need to stay equal and indeed wouldn't stay equal. Through their own efforts and drive, individuals were capable of improving their lot, or if they couldn't improve their lot, they would fail and have no one to blame but themselves. And you can find expressions of this in virtually every early liberal thinker. Probably the most prototypical example is, of course, John Locke, who was a major influence uh, on the American Revolution, where Locke insisted infamously uh, that the earth does not belong to everyone, it belongs to, as he put it, the rational and the industrious. And of course, this is going to have a long-standing impact on, say, American society, where early American revolutionaries like Thomas Jefferson argued in a very lofty and vain that unnatural or artificial aristocracy uh, is fundamentally problematic, this idea that we're going to have an aristocracy at birth. But natural aristocracy, as Jefferson put it, uh, an aristocracy of talent, of energy, and drive, that aristocracy is not only justified, but even required in a society like the United States. And of course, there's no need for me to kind of draw the class connotations of that. As Wendy Brown teaches us in her book, In the Ruins of Neoliberalism, it's very clear how the evolution of this possessive liberal attitude uh, was going to have calamitous effects going onwards. Uh, so one of the things that she points out in, in the Ruins of Neoliberalism uh, is at least in earlier reactionary thought, this idea of a kind of paternalistic noblesse ébligé softened the lot of the lower orders and insisted that the upper class or the ruling class had certain kind of responsibilities towards them. By contrast, in the contemporary era under neoliberalism, what you find is a ruling class that for the first time in history truly feels that it owes absolutely nothing to anyone at the bottom and blames the poor in many circumstances for their own lot by insisting that they could have risen if only through their own effort but chose not to for a wide array of different reasons. 
And the way that this relates, of course, to something like Trumpism is I don't think it's any coincidence uh, that when you see somebody like Trump emerge, the first thing he does is divide the world into, as he puts it very colorfully, winners and losers, with the argument being that the winners are those who constitute the natural aristocracy in the United States, but they're being dispossessed by all the so-called losers uh, in society, and of course they're allies in li amongst liberals and amongst the left. Now, does this mean that we should abandon liberalism uh, as a result of its entanglement uh, with this extraordinarily corrosive neoliberal attitude and ethic? My argument in my new book, the, the Political Theory of Liberal Socialism, is no. And the reason I emphasize this is because there is always a very different strain of liberalism that was not only very conscious of the limitations of classical liberalism, but set out to reform and indeed undermine it at every turn. It's no coincidence, I argue, that the two preeminent liberal philosophers of two centuries, John Stuart Mills and John Rawls, or the two Johns as I call them, both identified as socialists or argued for a kind of liberal socialism. In Mills' case, arguing that ultimately the capitalist class was parasitic, served no meaningful role in the economy, and should be expropriated through a transition to workplace cooperatives. Or in Rawls' case, there was this argument put forward that we should establish a distributed principle that's committed to caring for the least well off above all else, which will mean ultimately a transition to workplace cooperatives, to economic democracy, uh, and highly generous welfare state. So in my political, philosophy, I'm sorry, political theory of liberal socialism, I argue for a resurrection uh, of this egalitarian socialist strain of liberalism, saying that it deserves a chance at the future for two separate reasons. The primary reason that I argue liberal socialism should be the philosophy of the future is fundamentally a Hegelian one. Hegel once argued that the most dangerous ideology in enemy society isn't an ideology that is implanted from elsewhere, but the society's own ideology. And the reason a society's own ideology is the most dangerous for that society is because at some point people might actually expect the ruling classes to take that ideology seriously. And I think that positing liberal socialism as the fullest realization of liberal ideas and demanding that Americans be attentive to their own principles is one way of putting significant moral pressure on the ruling elites to try to enact the kind of reforms that we need to see. The second main argument I put forward for why liberal socialism deserves a shot at the future is it is undeniably the case, as far as I'm concerned, that the societies that have come closest to actually realizing socialism in practice are the Nordic social democracies. And it's no coincidence that Olaf Palm the Prime Minister of Sweden in the 1970s, proudly declared that we have gone further towards socialism than most of the countries that have declared themselves socialists. Now, without a doubt, there were significant problems to Nordic social democracy, which included the super-exploitation of the third world and mass amounts of environmental decay. But my argument is, if you get a rocket that takes you halfway towards the moon, but doesn't get quite get you there, you don't sit there and decide to try to reach the moon through a ship instead. What you do is build a better rocket, and that's fundamentally what I think we should be trying to do with a commitment to liberal socialism. Take what works about these models, try to ensure that they are radicalized in the way that is so important, and in the Baguettean sense, if they fail before, we might fail again, but we will fail better, and eventually we will succeed. Uh, thank you. Um, and um, I would like to begin, as uh, William F. Buckley used to say on his old firing line, in his very strange Atlantic accent, I would like to begin by um, establishing the difference between ancient democracy and what we now call liberal democracy. Ancient democracy, or the unconditional rule of the majority, arose in an era of slavery and subsistence agriculture where most people were very explicitly excluded from the political sphere. Whereas what we now call liberal democracy comes out with the, comes up with the rise of bourgeois society, or what Adam Smith called the commercial society, based on the inviolability of individual liberty, where this liberty became necessary for people to live and to obtain the means of life through their labor. And in this sense, democracy is not the rule of the majority of such, or mob rule as it was so often derisively referred to as, but the rule of the people, the demos, where the government exists through the consent of the government, and the people had a veto against arbitrary power, even violently. To quote a marvelous passage from the state constitution of Maryland, 
written during the heyday of the American Revolution. The doctrine of non-resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is absurd, slavish, and destructive of the good and happiness of mankind. And Marx also uh, expressed this difference between ancient and, and modern democracy in his criticism of the Jacobins, where they tried to hark back to an ancient, uh, an ancient collectivistic uh, conception of democracy in an era where that that made it very redundant, and that was part of the reason why the Jacobins imploded. And during the apogee of the bourgeois revolution, from the American Revolution to the French Revolution, one could say that the relationship between liberalism and democracy, or liberalization democracy, was complementary, even if sometimes uneasy and very tense, where democracy was used as a means to achieve uh, liberal ends. And by liberal ends, I mean a greater representation of the then developing and dynamic civil society that had arisen in, the, in Europe post, uh, post uh, the uh, collapse of um, serfdom, from Renaissance Italy to the Dutch Republic to England and so forth, within the political sphere, and creating a society where, if you will, the freedom of each is the sine qua non of the freedom of all. In other words, the flowering of the freedom and self-government of society as such. And you see this sentiment echoed in the words of Thomas Paine or other bourgeois revolutionary thinkers like Abbe Reynal, where they make a very clear distinction between society and government, where, and they say that society is good while government is wicked. And if government must exist at all, it is as a necessary evil and that it should be, or ought to be, the instrument of society for its own development. However, under capitalism or post-industrial revolution, liberal democracy isn't that liberal, or has rather become very, very liberal, and not that democratic. And with the rise of the Bonaparte state, you have a crisis within both liberalism and democracy, as such, where uh, civil liberties become uh, suppressed ever more, and where democracy in its most basic sense can be undermined. And th which um, brings me to this point, the crucial point that uh, as far as what socialism is concerned, how it should relate to liberal democracy beyond a simple uh, affirmation or defense of uh, bourgeois civil liberties against uh, reactionary forces or against arbitrary power, which any liberal can say. It is that this uh, crisis of uh, liberal democracy nonetheless does um, point beyond itself because any, uh, uh, any uh, democratic or any democracy presumes a state behind it, while the end zeal of socialism really is as a heretical once put it, a gentle anarchy, where the coercive forces uh, becomes minimized as much as pos presumably possible. And it is through um, socialism or communism that uh, confronts this problem, where the rule of the people can uh, becomes the rule of no one. Just uh, so you know who the fourth speaker is, this is Howie Hawkins. Um, he is a retired teamster from Syracuse, New York, and one of the co-founders of uh, the U.S. Green Party. Well, thank you, and uh, is that, you hear me? Oh. Give him the other mic. No? Hold on. Yep, now it's going on. How's that? Yeah. Yeah, that's okay, good. I, I was losing my voice anyway, but um, the microphone helps a lot. I apologize for being late. The plane was late and the public transportation was slow. And I can't believe you waited for me, but uh, hopefully it was worth it. We'll see. Um, so the question of the panel is liberal dem democracy in crisis. And just to briefly answer that, yes. Trump wants to jail his opponents if he gets elected. Biden wants to do bipartisanship with the party that tried to overthrow his election. 
He failed to take on the filibuster, restore voting rights. He's not defending democratic rights effectively anyway. Then we have a large section of the ideological left. Stanley Ronwitz used to make a distinction between the ideological socialist or anarchist left and the popular left, the progressive movements of people that you know, don't have a big theory they're working off of, they just got grievances and issues. And the ideological left, a lot of them are authoritarian. They excuse or apologize for governments that used to be, that called themselves socialists, you know, the Stalinist position. Now, as long as they're anti-US, whether it's Syria's Assad or Kim Dynasty's North Korea or Russia or China, they're for them. And that's anti-democratic and authoritarian, and I think has discredited the left for a lot of people in the popular left. The ideological has been discredited by these apologies and excuses. Internationally, you know, in the 80s and 90s, democracy was expanding. You had Taiwan, South Korea, South Africa, and then the former Soviet bloc moving toward democracy. Uh, and some of these struggles were very difficult, even revolutionary, at least overthrowing authoritarian regimes, like in Taiwan, South Korea, and South Africa. Um, and then uh, we've seen an authoritarian retrenchment. Russia's become much more authoritarian, China more so. Hong Kong lost a lot of rights. Modi in India. Uh, many African countries, you know, with coups and still one-party states. In Latin America, we see a swing back and forth. There's a struggle there between democracy and uh, autocracy. And then also in countries like Turkey, where Erdogan's authoritarianism was making gains until those elections last weekend, where the more progressive democratic forces seem to have gained. So liberal democracy is in crisis, but it's, you know, people are still fighting for those democratic rights. So, you know, we got a crisis, so what can be done? Uh, I was going to start the timer. They said 10 minutes. I just started it, so. Um, I'm, timing, over 10 minutes. I'm timing you. You're at three minutes. Okay, well, that sounds about right. <laughs> so I want to offer three pro-democracy practices that we could do at this time. And I start with the premise that full political democracy requires economic democracy. The economic democracy of a socialist economy, social ownership, democratic control. And that's certainly what Marx and Engels are fighting for. I think that's the way I read winning the battle for democracy in the Communist Manifesto. And one of the things I want to point out is this authoritarian that says, oh, you know, freedom of speech, assembly, multi party democracy, independent trade unions, all oh, those are just bourgeois democratic rights. They don't get what Marx and Engels are talking about. The problem with the bourgeois state or bourgeois democracy was that the capitalists controlled it. And those democratic rights, which Marx and Engels fought for, voting rights, freedom of speech, freedom of press, independent political parties, um, they were arguing that they can't be fully right, those rights can't be fully realized under a bourgeois or capitalist or liberal democracy. That's why you need economic democracy of socialism as well. Um, so that's, you know, I think the perspective we ought to take. And so three things I think we can do. One is electoral reform. If we're going to have an alternative to Biden trying to do bipartisanship with the Republicans and try to overthrow them, uh, a, a socialist left, a democratic socialist left, we need a multi-party system. And what we've got is a winner-take-all single-member district system that generates the spoiler effect that makes it really hard for independent parties on the left to get any traction. What can change that is proportional representation. We are winning ranked choice voting across the country. We've got, we went from two districts that survived the progressive era to about 20 in 2020 to over 50 now. And it's on the ballot in Oregon, DC, Nevada, this fall, probably Montana and Idaho. These are statewide, whereas most of the jurisdictions we have now are municipal. We do have Alaska and, and Maine. Uh, and it's possible in a couple of other states where you know, initiatives are going on now. This is a reform that we're winning. And then we need to expand. Of course, the Republicans want to ban it. But what we really should be fighting for, ranked choice voting, I'm assuming everybody knows what it is. That gets rid of the spoiler effect. 
But what we really need, particularly for legislative bodies, is proportional ranked choice voting, which is a form of proportional representation, single transferable vote. They use it in Ireland and some other countries. Um, we do that, then we got a multi-party system, and the left can have its own voice and power and representation in politics and fight for the full democracy of socialism. I think that's a game-changing reform, and until we have that, the left's gonna be marginalized, the movements are gonna be lobbying the Democrats, you know, protest, but they don't, the Democrats take their votes for granted. So, electoral reform, ranked choice voting and proportional ranked choice voting, for proportional representation. That's one of my three. Um, second one, I know the introduction to the panel talked about the new left. I was raised up in the new left politically. I'm more of the Port Huron generation than the weatherman generation, which I think were a bunch of privileged kids that, uh, you know, got frustrated and thought they knew better and did some stuff that really hurt the movement, I think. But coming out of the Port Huron generation, a couple of things. One is, and this is really from a guy that comes from the, the 30s generation, Murray Bookchin, who wrote an essay. It was influential on the, on the new left in SDS, part of what became the book, uh, Post-Scarcity Anarchism, called The Forms of Freedom. And what he wanted to do was institutionalize the kind of participatory democracy that was in the air. And a lot of it was kind of fuzzy. And he said, we need to institutionalize it. And the Forms of Freedom talks about how to do that. Popular assemblies and confederation. Something really comes out of the anarchist tradition. Um, and it, 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 I think it caught on at the 69 SDS convention, where they blew apart between the revolutionary youth movement, you know, one of which factions became, uh, became the uh, weatherman, another became the Revolutionary Communist Party, which I guess is still with us. And then uh, the other branch was Progressive Labor, a Maoist group, which really kind of brought a lot of ideological craziness into SDS. But most rank and file SDSers like me, we were poor Huron people. We wanted participatory democracy. And Bookchin had some resolutions and uh, things that, uh, you know, papers that put that perspective forward at that convention. Now, it didn't catch on there, it was a big fight. But I think one of the best histories of SDS, James Miller, Democracies in the Streets, he talks about the Radical Decentralist Project, and I think uh, he makes the case I'm, I'm trying to make right now. Uh, the other thing I'll just point out, and try to move on to my last point before I'm out of time, is uh, you may have heard of this uh, book uh, by Vincent Bevins, it's out called If We Burn, the mass protest decade and the missing revolutions. And I'm just halfway through the book, but I think where he gets to is that you gotta have something in mind in terms of how you wanna institutionalize the radical grassroots democracy, the freedom we're trying to create. And we've just gone, the book is about what we've called the revolutions of the squares, you know, from the Arab Spring and, and the thing in Turkey and then Occupy, Maidan and Ukraine and, you know, all over the world, but those, they were disruptive. They might have had a change of the nominal leadership, but like in Egypt, it ended up back with the military uh, leadership. So he's asking why that disappeared. I think what Bookchin offered was a way to institutionalize the revolution in a way that preserves the freedom and democracy. The other thing coming out of the SDS generation, and these are really the old Port Huron generation people, you know, like, uh, Robert Borsage, Lee Webb, and Leonard Rodberg, and Jim Ridgway. Uh, they were around the Institute for Policy Studies, and they came up with two proposals for reforms that I think embodied the kind of federated, decentralized, bottom-up democracy as a way of administering public services, in this case, healthcare and, and energy. The healthcare was a national health service bill that came out of the committee, uh, what do they call themselves? The Civil Rights uh, Medical Committee for Civil Rights. They patched people up who got beat up in civil rights demonstrations. Uh, they worked with Ron Dellums and, and others and with, at the Institute for Policy Studies and came up with this bill. And it was based on not a top-down you know, uh, bureaucracy, which kind of comes out in the New Deal, like Medicare. None of you look old enough to be on Medicare, but I can tell you, if you got a problem, you don't get a person, you get a, 
Okay, you get a robot. Um, so, uh, what they proposed was locally community health boards elected by the community and by the healthcare workers, and then a district level, a regional level, and a national level. Bottom up democracy to administer not just socialized payments, single payer, but a whole socialized system where the hospitals, the clinics, everything in the healthcare system was under public uh, ownership and control. And they did the same thing for energy, which was a big crisis in the early 70s. Would make a lot of sense now, you know, to, I mean, what we're doing now on climate is offering corporate subsidies instead of having public planning and ownership. So I think those kind of perspectives on, you know, the kind of reforms we should be fighting for. You know, single payer Medicare for all is not enough anymore, particularly with the corporatization of the whole range of healthcare services, you know, from ambulances to uh, cemeteries. So uh, that's the third perspective, putting these public services under grassroots democratic control. Thank you. title of uh, my presentation is building on a couple of articles that I published back in 2016 and in 2020. Uh, why not Trump again? Uh, I identify strongly with the wrongly accused. So does America more broadly. And Trump has been wrongly accused. If you're in the right, there is no need to lie, and they have lied about Trump. All the criminal charges and civil lawsuits against Trump, literally every single one, are using novel legal theories and unprecedented applications of the law. This is not because he was once president, and no president has been tried previously. Anyone sued or prosecuted this way would be in the same untested waters of injustice. And it is injustice. The idea of liberal democracy is that rights come before the law. Even those proven guilty have rights and that includes the right not to be prosecuted even if you are indeed guilty of the crime with which you are accused, even if you had criminal intent and deliberately did wrong. Prosecuting you can violate your rights. Prosecutorial discretion means that a choice not to do so can serve the ends of justice. But there is a choice and decision involved in prosecution that it is not automatic, gives it an air of arbitrariness and hence injustice. This is indeed the point of criminal trials, to prove that the state has the right, so to speak, to violate your rights, and an injustice will be allowed by representatives of the people, who are thus shown to be responsible for it. In this case, the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness will not be respected. It is understood that the law and the state that enforces it are inherent violations of your rights, of everyone's rights. In a criminal trial are present the three branches of government in the U.S. Constitutional Republic that we hear so much about. It is a democratic republic, even if it is not simply a democracy. The executive branch elected to enforce the law is present in the prosecutor, the judicial branch and the judge, and the people are in the jury of your peers. All interpret the law, all decide whether and how the law will be applied, if at all. In the separation of powers of checks and balances in divided government, the legislature is composed of representatives of the people who make the laws. But since it is representative and not direct democracy, the people are supposed to continually decide on whether the laws actually represent them. This is why they are constantly revised, and why representatives are constantly replaced, or at least hypothetically are supposed to be. The law does not have divine, but only human status. It is provisional, fallible, revisable, imperfect, and hence, fundamentally unjust. In a criminal trial, justice is not to be achieved, but is only at best a byproduct of the application of the law. It is the justice in the application of the law that is at issue, not justice for the crime, which is impossible. As God says, vengeance is mine. In modern, that is to say bourgeois society, it is understood that the law does not make society, but society makes the law. Society does not serve the state, but the state serves society. The US is not a democracy, so they say. 
at least not like ancient Athens, in which the state was society and society was the state, but a constitutional republic. Moreover, the Constitution is interpreted according to the principles of the Declaration of Independence, according to the principles of the American Revolution. It is not democracy because it is not the rule of the people, but rather the rule of law. And the rule of law is not identical with the rule of society. There are civil rights, meaning the rights of civil society against the state, against the laws that the state enforces. These rights are inalienable, they say. You can never lose your rights, but only have them abrogated, violated. And these rights are not only for citizens, but are human rights. They apply to everyone where the U.S. Constitution can hold sway. The U.S. is not a traditional nation state because the principles of the Declaration of Independence and U.S. Constitution are understood to apply everywhere and to everyone, at least where feasible. That means the scope and reach of the revolution. The U.S. constitutional order and system is revolutionary. It is expansive and ever-deepening. We continue to recognize and explore the full dimensions of rights, of freedom. This is not a local, but a worldwide phenomenon. The revolution has the power to protect all escaped slaves on its free soil and beyond. Do we still believe it? People around the world do. Perhaps some haven't heard it yet that somewhere they have been recognized as free. Citizen Trump is trying to go back to Washington. <laughs> Who is trying to stop him? Certainly not the people, or at least not all of them, perhaps not even a majority. Liberal democracy means, unlike ancient democracy, recognizing and protecting the rights of minorities against the majority, not least why there are civil rights against the law voted by the majority. And this includes a minority of one. A single person with whom no one agrees nonetheless has rights against everyone else. Do we still believe it? Capitalism demands that we surrender our rights to the needs not of society, but of capital. But we are liable to misrecognize the needs of capital as those of society. And of course, they are the needs of an alienated society. When we think we are serving the needs of society, we are inevitably always serving the needs of capital. We surrender our rights to the needs not of society, but of capital, always. Marx recognized long ago that socialism is capitalism. Capitalism is socialism. Socialism is not freedom, but it's alienated projection, a projection of capitalism. Capitalism is alienated society, and socialism is a projection of that alienation. This includes political alienation, which becomes a mystification of the law and the state, their reification and hypostasization. Ironically, since the bourgeois revolution had secularized the law and the state and removed them from the domain of divine justification and religious authority, bringing them within the realm of consciousness of society in history. That consciousness has withered. Marx critiqued socialism as an alienated misrecognition of the content of freedom, in which it appears as either anarchy or totalitarian statism, a pure irrationalism or a pure rationalism. But as usual for the Marxist dialectic, it is both and neither. Classical liberal thought is usually associated with the so-called minimal state, but this is misleading. In the conception of the U.S. constitutional order envisaged by the founders, the American revolutionaries, the tyranny of the state was not merely counterposed to the freedom of society, but the different elements of state power were counterbalanced against each other as opposed to tyrannies. The tyranny of law, the tyranny of judicial judgment, and the tyranny of executive action. Each was a dictatorship checking and balancing the others, a legislative dictatorship, a judicial dictatorship, and an executive dictatorship. It is the third of these that concern us here regarding Trump. Trump stands accused of abusing power and wanting to establish dictatorship. But against this, the dictatorial powers of the law and the state enforcement of it are being mobilized against his candidacy for re-election to the presidency. In so doing, Trump's opponents are threatening the authority and power of the executive embodied in the presidency as such. The president in the United States is an elected monarch, an elected dictator. This is especially so in capitalism, which brings out the necessity of dictatorial methods 
especially prominently, turning it from a rare occasion of emergency into the normal exercise in managing the rolling crises of capital. Marx called this the Bonapartism of the capitalist state, as distinct from its earlier pre-industrial revolution bourgeois form. This is seen in the rise of a permanent police force in prisons, both of which are inventions of the industrial era to control the proletariat. From the subsequent progressive era, we get a fourth branch of government, namely the permanent bureaucracy of the administrative state. It is the dictatorship of the deep state that has conflicted with that of the elected presidency. This has raised the issue of civilian government per se. Trump represents elected civilian authority over the state where they clash. Trump claims presidential immunity from criminal prosecution, the Lockean executive prerogative to break the law in order to preserve it. There is already legislative, parliamentary, and judicial immunity to prevent abusive exercise of law by the executive, which in Locke's moment was that of the hereditary monarchy and its appointed majesty's deputies, including judges. What is usually overlooked is the need to prevent the reverse, the legislative and judicial abuse of the executive function of government. There is indeed a deep state of permanent bureaucratic special bodies of armed men, as Marx and Engels called them, in the state of capitalism, which has sought to escape political responsibility to the civilian authority of elected office in the presidency. Trump was targeted by the deep state as well as by his political adversaries, Democrats and Republicans, from the beginning of his candidacy. Trump is wrongly accused, not because he didn't do what they say, but because his prosecution is wrongly motivated and is intended to abrogate liberal democracy in a very pointed way by violating the personal rights of an individual and denying the collective political rights of democracy. Marx declared the goal of communism to be a situation where the freedom of each is the precondition for the freedom of all. This was no utopian goal, but an existing value already in bourgeois society however violated by capitalism, but still to be aspired as a task in getting beyond it. It was a principle to be observed in practice so that its compromise could be recognized as a problem in the here and now, not to be accepted in its apparent but false necessity in capitalism. Socialism was to realize this. But the pseudo-left has long fallen into the antinomy of individualism versus collectivism in capitalist contradiction and has taken the latter as its own value abandoning personal liberty to the avowed right. However, conservative collectivism also belongs to the right, demanding the sacrifice of the individual. We should not agree to this demand, and certainly not in the name of social justice. The fact that Trump appears politically as both well a private person only selfishly motivated and a public menace unleashing the demons of popular fury is indicative of the contradiction that liberal democracy presents in capitalism. He thus perfectly embodies the issue, that he is an unremarkably moderate conservative centrist and his policies and politics only emphasizes this fact. Citizen Trump is the problem. The threat of fascism, the specter of ancient democracy and tribal republicanism has haunted the capitalist world from the, ince from the inception of its crisis. After long crying wolf about Trump, finally on January 6, 2021, Trump seemed to confirm the worst fears by submitting, uh, excuse me, sum summoning a mob to riot at the Capitol, to delay or prevent certification of his electoral defeat, to stop the steal. Perhaps, as Nixon said in 1960, they stole it fair and square, and so there's no point in challenging it. But the man has a right to speak, however demagogically, and the people have a right to protest against their government at its public buildings whose physical structures and political procedures all belong to them. And no one but them, they belong to us. Trump's election was protested by Democrats, so why is protesting Biden's election forbidden? The Democrats and established Republicans sought to delegitimize Trump's election, and Trump has returned the favor. Evidently, his most prized classified documents were those that showed his innocence of the Russia collusion hoax manufactured against him by the Democrats in the deep state. In this sense, we have the historic right and obligation, the duty as a society, to experience politically the phenomenon of Trump. For it shows all the weak and blind spots of liberal democracy and capitalism. As Tocqueville said, ironically, of American democracy, the public receives the government it deserves. 
As a society, we also get the public that we deserve. Trump demands that we confront the problem of politics this society has produced in capitalism. But Trump is, by far, not the worst example of it. As I wrote more than eight years ago when Trump first appeared on the political stage, the crisis of neoliberalism has been a crisis of its politics. And this takes the form of a crisis of liberal democracy, specifically of its political parties. All the anxious talk about populism betrays this fact. In ancient Rome, every election was attended by gang warfare and blood on the streets spilled by the competing factions. Candidates were assassinated and elections triggered civil wars, as in capitalism. Every election was a political revolution. This is still the case, and it shows. The bug is a feature, the glitch is the algorithm, the noise is the music of democracy. It is a Gesamtkunstwerk, but not necessarily a Gotikdemeron. Especially in the US, which is a continuation of the original American Revolution, Vivek Ramaswamy called for reinvigorating the spirit of 1776. He sees that in Trump. The answer proposed by Trump's traumatized opponents is to suspend rights and avoid election, to cancel liberalism and democracy, to ban the opera and imprison the diva. This is no exaggeration. They have done and will do everything they possibly can to try preventing Trump's election and taking office in the most remarkable series of events in the history of the US. Neither Trump and his supporters nor his opponents are wrong in saying that the fate of American democracy is on the line. The only question is what this says and what it means. Are we afraid to learn? We have yet to figure it out. Trump and Trumpism are not going away, whatever we may wish. The task of politics remains, even and perhaps especially in the crisis of capitalist politics. It points the way to socialist politics from the very heart of liberal democracy in crisis. Without a political party for socialism, this is the very best politics capitalism has to offer. Are we afraid of it? So I repeat the question for the third time now. Why not Trump again? So let's uh, go to the round of responses from the panelists. If you want to start, Jordan. Can someone pass the mic? So three to four minutes, please. Sure. Um, I suppose that when we talk about reform, uh, I really want to stress the importance of a scientific, globally applicable understanding of capitalism and its consequences. Okay? I want us to really zero in on the reality of so-called Swedish democratic socialism built upon a essentially imperialistic enterprise that still super exploits uh, the workers in the third world at its factories, right? Like the H&M uh, H&M factory in Bangladesh example, right? That is what Swedish socialism is built upon. Uh, we talk about building democracy. Democracy for who? Democracy for which people within the capitalist system here, right? I, when we talk about reform, I am simply not that interested uh, in reworking American capitalism if we maintain the basic processes that necessitate imperialist domination of other countries. The basic process of capitalist accumulation, of competition between capitalist enterprises leads to monopolization. That is how profits grow in this economy, and it necessarily leads to a basic competition of resources and cheap labor. So we can expand our rights, make reforms within the United States, but if we preserve the nature of, of the system of capitalism, right, it will necessarily conclude on a violent, imperialistic domination of somebody, somewhere, who will not be given a democracy. Um, I want to maybe touch upon um, something said, I, I believe by, I believe by Matt, um, where Marx says that capitalism was an improvement from feudalism for many. Um, I think that is in, in strokes true, but not entirely, right? Uh, for those of us in imperialist, na imperialist nations, yeah, capitalism is better than feudalism, but if you read a book like How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney, we see that 
Colonialism, which is capitalism, right, it is a function of capitalism, was a huge step backwards for the African continent as compared to African feudalism, right? It was not a step forward for democracy. Liberal ideas came to Africa, but they did not give them what we describe when we're talking about liberal ideas for us. They did not get any of that, uh, them, like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, the pursuit of hat, none of that, right? Even Napoleon famously said that fraternity, egalitarianism, all of those rights were not going to be extended to Haiti. That was not what he was about, right? Um, so when we talk about reform, I just, I really want to ask people, is that, is that really like all we're about? You know, we reform capitalism within America, and then the basic consequences of capitalism for the rest of the world, that's cool as long as we get changed elections, we get uh, some nationalized health care, we get publicly, public schools funded. Is that all we shoot for? And I want to affirm and assert the necessity of the real promotion of democratic ideas is that not just democracy for us, not just positive development for us, it's positive development globally. And I do argue that necessitates a full eradication of capitalism, right? Uh, and we, we need to really focus on ideology. Ideology. We need to focus on scientific understandings of capitalism uh, and of history, right? So that we can have those as our goals. Um, internationalism, I think, is a basic tenet of real democratic ideas. And we have to centralize them. And so I think that is my general opinion of reformism. Uh, and I think just to bring a question that we should eventually be gotten to, I wanted to ask Matt, where you said of, of Swedish socialism, it is essentially like a rocket that's halfway to the moon. Uh, I guess from this halfway point, uh, how do you see from a liberal socialist lens how you get it to the moon from here, from where it is at? Um, that is something I'm very curious about. Hey. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I really enjoyed the panel, uh, especially getting to meet some people who I've engaged with online uh, at great depth, but never actually got to see on the plus, which is uh, kind of an unusual thing about the COVID era. In terms of the kind of uh, broad strokes about my argument for liberal socialism, I want to stress uh, from the beginning, it's not necessarily reformist in the sense that it is anti-revolutionary or anti-radical. Uh, indeed, I think that the kind of dialectical approach to take to many of the instances is to realize that sufficient number of quantitative or structural changes, regardless of where they undertake, compounded over time, can lead to qualitative transformations in terms of the power relations that dominate our society at any given point. So in terms of what liberal socialism has to offer uh, as a kind of alternative path to socialism, something that can get us to the moon, again, I think that there are two core things to stress here. The first core thing to stress is that Whenever one engages in a kind of counter-hegemonic activity, it's very important to understand the rhetorical tactics that we deploy. And one of the key things that I think we need to do is to cease produce, presenting leftist ideas as radical or transformative, and instead present them as a kind of common sense or as a necessary transition. And I think that the very best leftist thinkers going back to the 18th century fundamentally understood this. Let's take one example, or, uh, Thomas Paine. So Thomas Paine was the quintessential American revolutionary uh, who also supported the French Revolution and indeed argued for an early form of social democracy. And one of the things that's emblematic about his very successful polemics uh, against aristocracy and indeed against the limitations of bourgeois French republicanism uh, is that he consistently claimed that what he was advocating for wasn't something that was highly deviant or that was somehow a radical transition. Uh, instead, as the name of his most famous pamphlet suggested, it was common sense because aristocracy, from his standpoint, was just such a ridiculous way of organizing the world that nobody who had half a brain could seriously contemplate defending it, certainly by the 18th century. And similarly, by the time you get to the rights of man, one of the things that you see him continuously emphasize is that this notion that private property should be reified and somehow naturalized uh, as though it pre-existed society is similarly a ridiculous idea. Payne is very expressed about the fact that property is a social institution it came into the world as a result of coercion, and consequently there is no need to reify property in the way that so many classical liberals took for granted. And I think that this demonstrates, and the success of Paine's polemics demonstrates, the kind of rhetorical approaches that leftists should be taking. Because when you present something as fundamentally radical or transformative, not only are you engaging in an undialectical approach, which suggests that there's going to be a radical break with history as it comes, I think that you 
allow the hegemonic powers as they exist right now to claim to be operating in the name of the common man or operating in the name of what everybody understands. And the left shouldn't allow reactionary forces this privilege. We should be the ones saying that, look, Medicare for all is common sense. Better voting rights for all is common sense. Swedish social democracy, it's a system that has worked very well for decades now. Jordan Peterson once famously said, you know, we've run the experiment a million times. Communism doesn't seem to work. I don't think that's necessarily true. But we should be inverting that logic and say, look, we've run the experiment now for decades. And it's very clear that these are the societies that provide their members with the highest quality of life on earth. Why not take advantage of that? And the second key thing that I wanted to emphasize is that in terms of Marxology, I think it's very obvious that Marx did not anticipate a kind of millenarian transition to socialism. I pointed this out in my previous talk, but if you read the critique of the Gotha program closely, one of the things that you really see is his insistence that the idea in the, on the utopian left that there can be some kind of transition to a society that is not stamped by bourgeois right, as he called it, is indicative of the worst tendencies uh, on the socialist left. Instead, he pointed out insistently that any society that socialism was to produce would be stamped, as he put it, with many of the features of the old society. And indeed, it would take several generations to be able to overcome those limitations and move towards a society where genuinely uh, we were able to say from, uh, from each according to his ability uh, to each according to his needs. Now, in terms of what this means for liberal socialism, I absolutely agree with you that the liberal socialist tradition, in theory, as I laid it out, has certain fundamental problems with it and has failed in many respects. However, I would argue that there are many fixes that we can incorporate that resolve a lot of these difficulties. So in my book, I dedicate a chapter to the so-called, um, sorry, so self-described black radical Marxist, uh, Charles Mills. Charles Mills uh, began as a Marxist, then later on transitioned to black radical liberalism, arguing fundamentally that the core ideas of the liberal tradition, understood with a lot of socialist compliments, were the ones that we should be respectful of for our future. And the reason, as he points out, is because there's a lot of good things in liberal democracy that are worth preserving. Things like basic rights, things like respect for minorities, things like um, political participation. And transitioning to a more radical future or a socialist future doesn't mean abandoning them, but doubling down on our commitment to them and ensuring that they are genuinely given to all rather than to just a few. So that's what I think I'll leave it at. Okay. Um... So, on, when it comes to democracy under capitalism, that it leads to two choices. You either have the dictatorship of capital or the dictatorship of the proletariat. And with, well, under now, it seems like we are debating on what version of the dictatorship of capital we should live under. What versions, you know, whether it's more socially democratic, or more classical liberal, or whatever. And the, what I would say is like, and I would disagree with, um, I'm sorry, Jordan, is that one doesn't eradicate capitalism, or one doesn't abolish it, or dismantle it, or whatever um, verb you want to use, is that one has to, in a sense, like, realize it. You know? And that's a very, kind of strange way of putting it and it's because what the dictation of the proletariat represents is the um, summit of this crisis that capitalism represents and what in reaching that summit there's the at least the potential of overcoming it and realizing the potential of bourgeois society in terms of achieving a world of universal freedom, eman you know, emancipation, you know, where human humanity can actually live out its history instead of living in the prehistoric world we currently live under. And that's why, in a sense, I was interested you were talking about um, common sense, or, which is how that socialism, in, in a sense, might seem initially conservative in this sense that it argues for very very basic thing in terms of like defending or affirming like bourgeois right like freedom of speech assembly and so forth and it's from then that's the, like the start of it that you you know embark on the quest to realize a more more 
deeper freedom that starts and arose with what liberalism started. Well, I, I'll make two points. Um, I don't think we should counterpose fighting for reforms to revolution. I mean, the whole socialist tradition, Marx and Engels, Luxembourg and Lenin, you know, the socialists led the reform fights. That's how to bring the masses into the movement. And what the socialists point out is the limits. You know, a job guarantee, the capitalists would hate that. And you fight for it, and then people see that even something makes common sense. We got a work ethic in this society. Everybody says, everybody wants to work should so they can support themselves and contribute to the economy and the people and the society. Instead, they'll find out that the people that run this country don't really want that. And that exposes why we got to change not just how we deal with employment, but the whole system. Same thing with fighting for health care. Who's going to fight that? The corporate interests are. And why don't the two major parties, the two corporate parties, fight for universal health care? You get in that struggle and you can explain to people why that's going on and why we need not just socialized health care, but a socialized economy. So I don't think you should counterpose them. There is a problem of reformism that thinks, you know, just one reform after another will get us to socialism. At some point, the people that are in power are gonna fight back and they'll be violent, like look at Salvatore Allende. So that raises whole other questions of how you deal with that. But to say that we can't fight for reforms now because that's not revolutionary, I think is anti-revolutionary. And then the other question about, we're not talking about socialism in one country, I'm certainly not. We need international social solidarity. And the problem we got now with a lot of the ideological left is they do a geopolitical analysis and they think, oh, if NATO or the US loses in Ukraine, it's gonna weaken US or NATO imperialism. Well, I got news for you. U.S. imperialism has lost every damn war from Vietnam to Iraq. The military industrial complex is bigger. And the international system of capitalist exploitation is in power. The IMF, the World Bank, the UN framework on climate, convention on climate change, you know, the COP conferences, and what I'll tell you what else is going on. U.S., China, and Russia, they go together. They jointly manage neoliberal global capitalist systems. They also compete, but it's, it's, it's an antagonistic kind of cooperation. Like all capitalists, they fight with each other, but they also have a joint interest in managing the whole system. That's the imperialist system we gotta fight. And it's US, but it's also Russian, Chinese, and these other big powers. So uh, we need a internationalism as well as uh, a revolutionary movement at home. All right, I wanted to say a couple of things. Um, uh, a few years ago, right before the COVID crisis hit in early 2020, um, we gave a panel at Columbia University in New York on the American Revolution on the left. And there I pointed out that um, socialism, if it were to win in the United States, um, will not be seen as the threat to American society, but as the potential salvation of American society. The threat will be seen as capitalism. Capitalism will be seen as the threat. I think that since the 1960s, um, there has been, under the rubric of anti-imperialism, really an anti-Americanism that I think is really problematic. Um, so I don't think that anti-Americanism makes any sense either in the United States or really at a global level. Um, a, a real working class socialist movement in the United States will be transformative for world politics and for world society. And the basic reason for that is that the American working class, the working class in the United States, has a living connection to the working class of the world through immigration through you know, their family connections. I mean, literally the entire world's uh, cultures, nationalities, ethnicities, religions are all present in the United States. So a real working class uh, socialist movement here would have a direct, living, organic connection to the working class throughout the world. So this anti-Americanism, 
that got started in the 1960s, uh, really way past due at this point, I would say. And anti-imperialism is no justification for that. Um, I don't think that the civil liberties in the United States are bought at the expense of the people of the world. No. Do any of you still want to uh, add anything to, in this response section? I think the democratic thing to do would be to pass it off to the audience. Are you ready for the Q&A? Okay. All right. Uh, can somebody can... struck by the fact that none of the other four panelists responded in any way to Chris's comments about Trump. I'm wondering whether that indicates agreement or whether there are disagreements that were not expressed. Um, and the question I wanted to ask, though, of all the panelists, I'll fly, is the 20th century saw many regimes that were one-party regimes that expropriated the bourgeoisie and certain nation states in large parts of the world and instituted centrally planned economy. You can call these regimes by different names, state socialism, communism, Stalinism, whatever. What I would like the panelists to address is what remains of that legacy? What are the lessons to be learned, positively or negatively, from those regimes? <laughs> Governments, revolutions. Thank you for that question. I think when we see uh, the Soviet Union in particular, we see not something that can be statically summed up as that was a constant, and this is the way you describe it, but it is really an evolving process that went in stages and has good and bad elements at every stage, right? And so we, when we talk about the Soviet Union, um, a malice conception of it is that while there were good elements, uh, socialism fundamentally ended in 1956. Right, and this is when Khrushchev takes over and introduces the three peaceful, peaceful transition, peaceful competition, uh, and peaceful cooperation, or peaceful coexistence, shall I mean. Right, he introduces the concept that the supposed proletarian party is the party of the whole people in a country that still contains capitalism, right? Uh, and we get into these questions of how does capitalism get eradicated, right? How does capitalism become dismantled by a proletarian state, supposedly, right? And I think it kind of unfolds some of the basic flaws in the Soviet system. It was a little too vertical. They did not do enough work to win the hearts and minds of people uh, and grasp you know, the scientific nature of capitalism. The party did way too much ideological work on its own, uh, did way too much top-down management of the economy. And so when revisionism uh, manifests within the party, when the right line within the Soviet Union starts to argue for state capitalism being socialism, right, and not an unwon battle against capitalism, um, we see some of the major errors of Stalin himself, the purges, um, the suppression of dissent that I think has some overreach in it, but also we see Stalin, the best elements of what Stalin did as a leader in his arguments against uh, revisionism on the, from the right line, where he argues that no, uh, the proletarian party must continue to fight capitalism, we must continue to support armed revolution for liberation, whether it's national liberation or social liberation, because if we don't, if we allow capitalism to become the dominant trend within the Soviet economy, what does it lead to? It leads to social imperialism, right? Where we see the Soviet Union try to assert itself as the core of the socialist world, wherein Cuba is now essentially a unself-reliant, but a dependent economy on the Soviet Union that exports sugar. The Soviet bloc are now dependent economies that are not self-sufficient and therefore undemocratic, and they support the Soviet Union. This is what happens when you allow capitalism to be the dominant trend in your supposedly socialist state. This is when you step away from the battle for proletarian power, when you step away from the battle of um, eradicating capitalism fully and all of the messiness 
and the mistakes that unfortunately came with that in the Soviet experience, right? This is where uh, we see China under Mao, the Sino-Soviet split, they break from the Soviet Union. Mao criticizes Khrushchev as an enemy of the working people, right? We see the Chinese communes be expanded. They see the left line within China argue against all Khrushchev's ideas. Uh, meanwhile, the Soviet Union continues to restore capitalism. Uh, we un understand from Mao uh, the uh, inner party bourgeoisie, as he describes it, where state capitalism essentially just becomes capitalism, capitalism. You see the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, the process of state monopolies kind of leading into a social imperialist conflict with the United States, where it is less about liberating the working class globally as much as it is expanding the state socialist economy of the Soviet Union in much of the same way that monopolies try to expand internationally within imperialist countries, right? And so we see a degeneration. We see a degeneration of the Soviet economy uh, that trends away from the proper battle for socialism and in the 1990s, uh, it collapses into just a full-blown capitalist state that we see today. And so I would say the lessons from um, what you were describing as Stalinist states is just some very tough lessons in anti-revisionism, very tough lessons of what fighting against capitalism consistently and unwaveringly really consists of. We see the consequences of stepping away from that crucial fight, right? Uh, because, I mean, I don't know if anyone would argue that Russia is a good place right now. It is anything but uh, a monopoly capitalist state that is very undemocratic, right? Um, and it's really just depending on how you understand capitalism, how you understand its necessity to be eradicated or not, right? Um, the importance and the essentialness of fighting against it to fully eradicate it, the, essential, the essentiality of proletarian power over the capitalist class, and not allowing capitalism to ascend within your economy uh, for convenience reasons, because fighting is inconvenient for you, or because there is a lot of mess and mistakes being made, right? Um, that is, these are the lessons of the Soviet Union. It's, its degeneration speak much to what um, creating a social consensus of. A brief follow-up question? Yes. I gather from your statement that you think it was a good thing in terms of the inter-political debates in the 20s of the Soviet Union that Stalin tried. Uh, yeah, I think that it's Against a good... Bukhar and Trotsky. Wait, I'm sorry. Please say that last part again. I gather from your assessment of Stalin, which is not uncritical, that you, you do think, however, that in terms of the political struggles of the 1920s, that it was a good thing that Stalin triumphed, that Stalin was the best of the political tendencies that emerged in the Soviet Union. I do not happen to be a Trotskyist. I do think um, Stalin was better than Trotsky, but I also don't think that Trotsky was going to be a leader within the Soviet Union. Regardless, um, Lenin was not a big fan of his. Neither was much of the Soviet Central Committee. Um, I think Trotsky has made some good critiques of the Soviet Union at times, uh, but it was, it was going to be Stalin. Uh, for better and for worse. He is a very flawed Marxist-Leninist. Um, but we have to divide one into two, as we say within Marxism, and understand the good and the bad within the entirety of the process that we have to work with. Yes, oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, right? Uh, this is one that I'm sure everybody here is somewhat familiar dealing with. You know, well, what about the Soviet question? What about the Maoist question? Uh, I think that in terms of the kind of positive impacts of the Soviet Union, which is why well, I want to be clear, a state I do, whose demise I do not mourn in the least bit, right? The one positive effect that it did have is that the mere existence of a state that was purportedly committed to Marxism and socialism uh, did put pressure on many of the dominant capitalist economies in the globe to try to enact certain kinds of reforms uh, that would be to the benefit of workers within them, and even to undertake certain kinds of reforms in the direction of things like uh, racial and gender equality, because the Soviets were very good at polemicizing uh, against the United States, claiming, look, uh, you argue that you are anti-fascist, that you're committed to equality, uh, but then think about all the lynchings that are going on in the American South. And there's a lot of actual evidence that suggests people like Truman, people like Eisenhower, were sensitive to these critiques uh, in the geopolitical rivalry with the Soviet Union, especially once it became very clear that many anti-colonial movements were looking to the Soviets as the primary uh, geopolitical power that would secure their emancipation precisely because there were so many problems within the capitalist states. So I think that there was a kind of positive pressure there, although again, I want to be very clear, I do not mourn the demise of that state at all. 
in terms of what this signifies for the left today, uh, I think that it is important in some respects to teach the importance of the Soviet Union in fighting things like the Second World War. Uh, one of the things that I've experienced over the course of my very short time, admittedly, teaching at American universities is that there's this predominant narrative uh, that Nazism was primarily anti-British, like anti -British, primarily anti-American, uh, and that ultimately it was D-Day that brought an end to the Second World War. Uh, I don't think that that's at all true, right? It's very clear that 75% of Axis forces were allocated to the Eastern Front. Ultimately, it was the Soviets that liberated Berlin, and it's important to be clear about those kinds of histories. Saying that, uh, I see very little value in getting into debates with reactionaries or with liberals about the legacy of the Soviet Union. Not because we cannot win those kind of debates, but because the optics of engaging in those kinds of debates are predominantly negative. Uh, so whenever people pressure leftists to get into debates about, well, was the Soviet Union real socialism? Did the Soviet Union commit all these massacres? I always recommend that we actually change the subject to something that's a lot more pertinent to the present day. Things, again, like Medicare for all, things like securing democratic votes for all, things like being critical of the carceral state, because these are areas where fundamentally reactionaries have a much harder time defending the status quo as it is, exists right now. My feeling is that when you get into arguments about the Soviet Union, even if you're able to argue against the kind of polemicizing that they're doing, from an optical perspective, most people will just see you as defending an authoritarian regime, and it just is not a kind of look that is going to be advantageous to progressive causes in the long run. Okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, I, did, I didn't address Chris's remarks on Trump because I mostly agree with it, so <laughs> that's that. Um, secondly, on the question of the Soviet Union, um, Really, I think socialism, if you will, the old struggle for revolutionary socialism ended sometime in the 1920s, not in 1956, personally. And what the, leg the legacy of the Soviet Union and the planned economy is that it um, was really a, an admittance or a, an artifact of the self-destruction of the socialist movement and a resignation to you know a more conservative uh, position and unfortunately the effect of that has been the creation of many sort of one-party states that really were more nationalistic than were you know that had anything to do with socialism like even even with uh, states like Ba'athist Iraq and Syria which weren't Marxist or ostensibly Marxist but did see the Soviet Union as a kind of inspiration for a kind of nationalistic, ethnic socialism that you see even with, under Stalin. And you even see this with, um, you mentioned, you know, the Soviet Union's victory on the World War II, which was a very nationalistic, you know, yeah, you know, uh, you know I've played Call of Duty too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, invoking like sort of, you know, the previous greater Russian, you know, nationalism as opposed to, you know, kind of internationalist uh, uh, ethos. And yeah, so I, I think the left has to kind of get over this hump over 1917 and what happened and just has to accept that what the next time, if you will, uh, that there is a, really a revolutionary movement will happen in a very different way to what the Bolshevik revolution did because the conditions are just so entirely different to what happened then. Well, Trump, I, I, I'm kind of baffled listening to it. Um, <laughs> Maybe I missed something, but I think I heard he's wrongly accused and wrongly prosecuted. And I'll tell you, I've you know, heard that excerpt from the call to Raffensperger in Georgia, just need 11,000 more votes, he was trying to steal an election. And that protest January 6th was not just a public demonstration, it was violent. There were right-wing cadre looking to make violence, and there was violence against you know, police officers and whatnot in the Capitol. Um, 
you know, hanging on to all those documents and then trying to hide them and move them, sneak them around. I mean, come on. This guy, I'm from New York. We know this guy been a crook, a gangster, his whole life. I mean, he wouldn't pay his contractors. He had these guys from Poland, you know, undocumented workers. And then they had to be, uh, you know, uh, deported, uh, which is for everybody, you know, who's not documented being deported, except when they work for him. And then he didn't pay them. I mean, the guy's a crook. And I think he should be prosecuted. So um, maybe I missed something. It, it was kind of a a complicated argument and, you know, some of the things he's referring to sounded good, but then, you know, <laughs> don't accuse, don't tr prosecute. No, I'm not with that. Um, and as far as, you know, lessons from the Soviet experience, look, I think there's nothing positive, and this goes for Mao's China too, where millions of people have been put in prisons and killed. Whole Baltimore, you know, the imposed famine, and not just Ukraine, but Kazakhstan and elsewhere. Um, that's inexcusable. And to call that part of our socialist tradition discredits us. I mean, it's been a huge problem now since, you know, the show trials in the 30s and the communists are like saying, well, it really didn't happen. And Will Durant at the New York Times saying it's not happening, which we know is all a big lie. So that's number one. Number two. One lesson is you can't have socialism in one country. The failure of the revolution to spread to Europe, isolated Russia and then, you know, the Western countries invaded, like a dozen of them. You know, it's hard to you know, carry out your program when you've got 12 armies after you. Um, and then democracy. I think, you know, the, Soviet, the, the Bolsheviks made a mistake. They temporarily banned factions and then other parties, and it didn't end up being temporary. And it just, you know, laid the basis for Stalin coming in and, you know, ruling, you know, brutally from the top down. You also asked about economic planning. Now, I think there are lessons to be learned when they, you know, through their state bureaucracy, they were trying to plan the whole economy without having the means to do it, like, you know, the kind of computers we got today. So, you know, ironically, I think the left SRs and who guard at one point where they were saying that the rural economy market-based, like the farmers, you know, produce and sell to the cities rather than totally exploiting them to industrialize. But while having the industrial sector planned, that was easier to do. Um, I think there's a lot to learn there. Um, and I'm not going to give you all the lessons now because I don't have them at hand, but there's been a lot of discussion of that. There's things to learn from that, I think, in terms of how to do a social economy. Um, so, and then last point. Um, it was suggested that we just don't talk about the Soviet Union. We can't avoid that question. I mean, it keeps coming back. It comes up with contemporary societies, like what's going on in Nicaragua? You know, where all opposition is being suppressed. You know, that's another example. It's, you know, looks like Stalinism to me. Okay. That's right. All right, I'm just gonna say something about the 20th century. Um, and, uh, you know, just as a thought experiment, Nothing happened in the 20th century. Nothing happened in the 20th century. Meaning, clearly a lot happened, but I have in mind, uh, you know, Hegel. You know, there are uh, blank pages of history. There are times and spaces in which history doesn't happen. That doesn't mean that things didn't happen, but it doesn't mean that history didn't progress in terms of consciousness of freedom. Um, a lot of you know, what we've been now briefly uh, talking about, about social democracy and Stalinism, um, really what you had is an unresolved crisis of capitalism, meaning there was a failure to overcome capitalism and everything flowed from that. There was a failure to overcome capitalism and that led to these kinds of measures being taken, whether um, the kind of crash industrialization, and centralized planning in the way, in the a purpose that it served in places like the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and China, or even in Cuba. Um, and the softer version of that, social democracy in Western Europe. You know, Europe was destroyed by World War II. Um, a great part of uh, global capitalism was destroyed in World War II. It was rebuilt through 
a deliberate effort at capital accumulation on the part of Stalinism and social democracy. I don't think that that uh, really points beyond capitalism. It's the way capitalism was preserved. It's the way we've arrived still in the 21st century with capitalism. Um, so again, the thought experiment. There was a lot of violence. There was a lot of struggle. But in 2024, what can we say and, and it ultimately amounted to? Uh, I have two questions. Um, first, um, I, I would like to pose a question on the use of the term Bonapartism. Now, the original context where it comes up for uh, Marx is in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. And in that specific context, it is a critique of a so it is a, in a critique of a bourgeois republic, essentially arguing that the, the, the forces of financial capitalists and landed capitalists came together in the bourgeois republic, turning it from just, you know, sort of like the pure republic concept that like sort of petty bourgeois radicals wanted into a, a monarchy in the garb of a republic, concentrating power within the executive branch having a professional army crush, crush the people and the uh, working class, just the working class, and that, that, that connects to, that connects to sort of like the current moment and the way that we use Bonapartism to describe the current, uh, current United States specifically how like power has been concentrated at the executive branch continually gro growing and how with the establishment of the standing army with the US Constitution how a sort of state within a state has grown around the powers of the executive branch around the sovereign power of the president as commander-in-chief and the administrators around that have created a state within a state that is completely free of any kind of popular will, uh, popular influence or will. Um, in that sense, how how can we speak of like bon of America being both a Bonapartist, being Bonapartist in its current state, and democratic? Is the the first question. The second question is, the Paris Commune is not mentioned at all in this like panel, like completely. Like, sort of the importance of it is like established in like Marx's work, uh, Marx's work, The Civil War in France, and specifically the sort of way in which the proletariat gains power through the establishment of a social republic that doesn't have a balance of powers. It is the direct will of the people as led by the vanguard of the proletariat uh, through, uh, through people's militias, judici uh, judges that can be called by uh, 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 election and directed, directly elected representatives. Um, it, so it, it really seems like to me like there's this underlying failure to like separate sort of like a Republican tradition which upholds the Democratic Republic as the will of the majority, the people, against a sort of liberal tradition which leans more towards the creation uh, and maintenance of constitutional monarchies and the defense of bourgeois right um, there. So that, I just, I, I just wanted to ask why the Paris Commune doesn't come up for the other panelists. So to that first point, um, it's interesting because Bonapartism is not a term that I run into very often, right? Um, but I think it describes something that is very intrinsic to just capitalist development, right? Where we see, as you said, um, consolidation around the executive powers, right? Um, and I think really what that represents 
starting from the argument that a bourgeois state is not democratic, right, for the entirety of the people. Uh, what that represents is simply the bourgeois class kind of chewing through the reforms that have been accomplished the New Deal in the 60s and doing what they were always going to do, right? While there are different factions within the bourgeoisie who compete for political power, compete for representation in the state, they are obviously willing to subvert democratic norms, legal norms, uh, any reforms that get in their way that represent the people, right? To consolidate power into a, as few people as possible to enforce their will, right? That is just the process of monopolization. That is the process of capitalist development at play. And so I don't think that this is, it even needs a, a new label. This is just the basic, this is just the basic development of capitalism. This is what they were always going to do. This is how you continue to maximize profits and expand your uh, monopolies within the system. You need to consolidate uh, power within the state. And yeah, for the moment, different factions of the bourgeoisie fight over these offices and to an extent they're willing to honor constitutional norms like the uh, election results sometimes or the Supreme Court sometimes, right? But all of the rights that are, are easily erodible, our rights, the rights that we got through reforms, because we lack state power, because we lack uh, an ability to enforce our will over the bourgeoisie, those are the first to go. Um, and an increasingly powerful executive is just a kind of a, a reflection of this process. Um, so I think that uh, your question just kind of like reiterating the key lessons of the Paris Commune and asking us why we have not brought it up so far. Uh, am, am I understanding like? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I think there is definitely some elaboration that just kind of has to be made about the dictatorship of the proletariat and what its role in social change, right? Because what is significant about the Paris Commune, while incredibly brief, is that unlike the um, original French Revolution, this was not an alliance with the uh, proletariat, with the bourgeoisie, where the bourgeoisie ultimately maintains power. This was the working class taking power in and of themselves, right? Forming their own um, methods of organization to impose their will. Uh, and yes, they created a, an, uh, uh, attempted to create a, a more democratic method of decision making, of resolving the problems of uh, distributing resources. And I think, what has to be kind of elaborated on is the necessity of this uh, in creating democracy for the people. Um, it, capitalism is not a democracy. There is no democracy under capitalism. It has to be uh, like undone, it has to be eradicated. And to enact that process, the working class, the people who have no vested interest in capitalist exploita exploitation have to organize amongst themselves and devise ways to impose their will on the enemy classes uh, and that is I think just a point, and these, like, how important that is in realizing democracy is something that this panel, I think, has touched on, but uh, we really need to kind of get into the nitty gritty of, and the Paris Commune is one of you know, the world's first examples of that process, and that is what makes it relevant, and still relevant, um, to ongoing social struggle, struggles for democracy today. So I do appreciate you being, unfortunately, being the first one to bring it up, but it is very, very important. Thank you. Yeah, two important questions. Uh, to the first one, right? Um, Marx famously declared that, you know, following Hegel, history repeats itself, first time as tragedy, then as far as with reference to Bonapartism. Uh, and I think that there's a dimension of that that we can appreciate when we try to understand the 19th century. But my understanding of Napoleon III very much isn't as a repetition of Napoleon I, uh, but instead as a kind of shadowy figure that anticipates far darker kinds of politics that are going to come. So on the left, there's long been this tendency to assume that there's something coextensive uh, between bourgeois forms of reaction or bourgeois liberalism and the political right generally. Uh, and I think that's a mistake. So there are many forms of right-wing doctrine out there that are very militantly anti-liberal and indeed militantly anti-capitalism, uh, anti-capitalist. And initially, uh, after the French Revolution, many of these seem to have been routed decisively uh, by the upswing uh, in Republican sentiments. But very quickly, the political right began to learn that it could appropriate a lot of the language of democracy and indeed the language of the left to try to push for more reactionary forms of government than would be permissible uh, under bourgeois conditions. Probably the most emblematic figure uh, in this respect on the political right was a 
militant reactionary called Joseph de Maistre, who commented on the French Revolution. Uh, and he said, there's this bizarre idea that the revolutionaries have that republicanism or democracy elevates ordinary people. In fact, that's entirely mistaken. Uh, republicanism and democracy for ordinary people means ordinary people get to vote, and there's something banal about that. Whereas monarchy, monarchy elevates people because they're able to participate in its splendor and enjoy the grandiosity that only monarchy can allow them. And this is very much anticipated what Napoleon III was very capably able of doing uh, in the middle of the 19th century, where he integrated many of the tropes and ideas of left-wing rhetoric into a fundamentally reactionary program uh, that was nominally committed to workers and had a kind of plebiscitary quality to it, uh, but of course was fundamentally about retrenching the power, not just of reactionary capital, but of reactionary forces in France more generally, including those further to the right. And the reason I said that this intimated a far darker future uh, is, of course, Napoleon III himself was ideologically mercurial and never really committed himself to any transformative or utopian project that could then be internationalized. But the fascists that drew very heavily on this paradigm in the 1920s did not make the same mistake. They very heavily learned the lessons of Napoleon III in trying to appropriate various elements of left-wing thought together aligned, of course, with uh, bourgeois capital in places like Italy and in places like Germany, and evolved in a direction where they're able to offer an alternative vision of society, predicated on this idea of palygenetic racist ultranationalism, and arguing that this is actually the wave of the future. Uh, and of course, this would mean denying people within those own, their own states rights to vote, rights to meaningful participation. But just as the Maestra intimated centuries ago, the fascists would say, why do you want to participate in democracy? Why do you want to participate in banal things like voting when you can be part of a master race directed by a leader to these grand projects of imperialist conquest all over the globe? And it's very sinister that tens of millions of citizens decided that in a choice between socialism or even bourgeois democracy and the vision of fascism based on these kind of Napoleonic urges, they thought that fascism was far more appealing. Now, with regard to the question about the Paris Commune, I absolutely agree that it was a remarkable democratic experiment that deserves to be commended and deserves to be learned from. Uh, however, in terms of Marx's interpretation of this, as I made clear in my last presentation, I think there are certain fundamental problems with it. Uh, and I think the fundamental problem with it is precisely that it places an enormous amount of weight on the importance of direct democratic legislation uh, with not sufficient concern for countervailing structures of power uh, that might be able to put a check on direct forms of democratic legislation. Uh, now, I understand that for many people, this might seem like an argument for the constraints of something like bourgeois democracy, and to a certain extent it is. But there are two ways of understanding this, right? Uh, one is that the constraints imposed by bourgeois democracy on direct legislation can be a way of trying to control the working class, as it is, for instance, in Madisonian uh, forms of republicanism, right? Where Madison was very expressed in Federalist 10 that society is always gonna be divided between two different classes. There's gonna be the productive and the unproductive, and it's the goal of the government uh, to divide power so that the working class is never able to obtain enough power in the United States to meaningfully enact change. But there is also an another argument, there isn't more positive leftist argument for putting constraints on direct democratic legislative power. And that's an argument for equality, right? We must always recognize that democracy does not need to be committed to some form of equality, as Carl Schmitt teaches us. Democracy, especially majoritarian democracy, can be very committed to the idea that those of us who belong in the majority will grant ourselves all the rights, all the privileges, all the powers in the world, and everyone else it will be ostracized and isn't entitled to any of them. And in that respect, a division of powers that respects the fundamental rights of individuals, including against majorities, I think is absolutely vital to securing the conditions for a society where the equality and the dignity of all are respected. So that's why I am wary uh, of these forms of direct democracy uh, with the kind of hyper-legislative quality to this of the sort that you see in Marx's ruminations about the Paris Commune. Uh, and just so nobody thinks I'm plagiarizing anything, uh, this is an argument I got from Irving Howe. So. I'll credit him, uh, or you know, play him. On uh, Bonapartism, uh, I see it as like a, a term for a more general um, development of you know the big state under capitalism, where the state expands and grows in a 
in a way that wasn't expected in the 19th century, and that that was one representative of the crisis that capitalism of the crisis that capitalism represents. And what you have is a state or that governs over and above society instead of, as I mentioned with Thomas Paine and Abbe Reynal, that where society uses the state as its instrument for its own development. With bipartisan, that relationship is flipped, where the uh, society is used by the state for its own purposes. Or, and, and in an extreme form, we see this kind of development of state power and you know, as um, in totalitarianism, where you know that's like the ultimate, um, you know, uh, apogee of you know the the citizen as the property of the state, as opposed to the state being the property of the citizen. Um, so that so that's how I see Bonapartism. As with the Paris Commune, like of course in the history of socialism, the Paris Commune is is incredibly important and crucial because because of it was a very even though a small but very significant moment of the proletariat actually seizing power and organizing itself in a in a in its own way without say the mediation of like other classes or the state and but at the same time we should be you know careful not to kind of you know, see it through this kind of misty eye, you know, this is, you know, nostalgic in a way that, you know, that's, we should sort of look on these past events with a very nostalgic view that we should always be kind of self-critical and, you know, conscious of its limitations. And, you know, the, obviously the Paris Commune was just limited to Paris. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't upscale to, you know, France or the world. So just we should be careful with these sort of, how we talk about these sort of, sorts of things. Well, yeah, I, I don't talk about Bonapartism because most Americans don't speak French. I mean, they don't know that history. <laughs> uh, but there is a concern. I, we might have creeping Bonapartism, the presidency you know, has become the imperial presidency. We've been talking about that since Nixon, and it's become more so. Military industrial complex, Eisenhower, you know what he's talking about, warned us about that, and it continues to grow. I think it's a problem, and it makes uh, the power of the people to make a difference and change policy even more remote than before. Congress, yeah, well, okay, if a Congress wanted to do something, this one doesn't, but uh, the president, has a lot of ways of resisting. And you know, we're getting it in the judiciary side with the idea of the unitary presidency. That's an authoritarian idea that the Federalist Society promotes. So um, I think what Marx was bringing up with Bonapartism, talking about what happened in, back in the 19th century is relevant. But to follow up on the last thing you said, I just don't use that word with you know, talking to people, because I don't think it's, uh, in most circles, something they're familiar with. Um, the Paris Commune, I mean, that's what I was talking about when I invoked Murray Bookchin, who talked about the Paris Commune a lot. And one thing about, you know, the split between the anarchists and the Marxists, they all liked the Paris Commune, you know, they all praised it because uh, it was a new form of governance. And it was bottom-up, uh, sectional assemblies who sent municipal councillors who were elected, recallable, and they had the imperative mandate. In other words, they could give instructions to those councillors on how the section they represented, which is like a neighborhood, uh, should act on the council. So uh, I don't think that's making a direct democracy on every decision, but it does give the people at the grassroots the power to tell their representatives when they want to intervene, they have a means of doing so. Um, and I think that's all to the good. Now, you also brought up Mark saying that it combined executive and legislative functions together. And I think, well, I'm going on what Murray Bookchin said somewhere, that was wrong because it reduced, you know, checks on power and 
you know, everybody should have a say in policy making. That's different than the administration of a policy that's decided. I mean, just for practical reasons. You don't want the whole sectional assembly to go out and watch them put a fire hydrant in because the council decided, or the section decided, we need a new fire hydrant. It just doesn't make sense. Um, but it's also an issue of, uh, that you were bringing up, that you, know, uh, you want people to have considered decisions, but not have them dealing with every little detail because then you know, it's too much and the, and the important decisions won't be good. So uh, I originally was going to, but I cut from my opening remarks, say something about the unitary executive theory, which I think is actually worth defending. So let me, let me argue why that's the case. Um, regarding the imperial presidency and Bonapartism, uh, again, this is where this language that's been uh, mobilized by the right might have a kernel of truth to it, namely the deep state. So the post-Watergate reforms, the post-Nixon reforms that were instituted, the unitary executive theory were Nixonians who wanted to roll back those reforms. So what did those reforms amount to? They amounted to um, preventing the president from interfering with the Justice Department. And what's under the Justice Department are the FBI and career prosecutors. So in other words, it was to insulate career prosecutors, career law enforcement, lifelong careerists in law enforcement, the FBI, from civilian authority, from elected authority. Right? It was to empower the deep state and prevent an elected politician from being able to control them. I don't think that's a good thing. And indeed, uh, that gets us to the question of bonapartism, because it's not just a matter of this or that form, or you know, these are you know, these policies or these reforms, these administrative measures that have been taken, but rather, where do they come from? What's the necessity of these things? Um, it's true that the, the uh, Marxist idea of bonapartism is a little exotic. Uh, you know, there's a liberal concept of bonapartism, which is quite different, but the Marxist concept is, is a little strange. Um, so what's the strangeness of that Marxist concept of bonapartism? that capitalism has actually created this necessity of statism, of state control, state management of society. Uh, in Marx's own time, he was concerned that socialists were gonna be Bonapartists. And indeed, um, Louis Bonaparte, Napoleon III, was himself a socialist. He himself came out of uh, Saint-Simonian utopian socialism, and he carried out a lot of his reforms under the rubric of socialism. And Marx was extremely critical of that. He was also critical of the fact that Proudhon, ironically enough, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, the father of anarchism, actually supported Louis Bonaparte as against the capitalist bourgeoisie. And he saw something similar happen with Ferdinand LaSalle with regard to Bismarck. And Bismarckism was influential in the socialist movement outside of Marxism, namely Fabian socialism. The Labour Party, they were admirers of Bismarck. And progressives, right? progressive liberal capitalist politicians like Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson were also admirers of Bismarckian quote unquote socialism, if you will, um, statism. So that necessity is a real thing in capitalism. And Marx actually had a dialectical understanding of the relationship between the Second Empire and France the empire of Napoleon III, and the Paris Commune that came out of its collapse in the Franco-Prussian War. He saw them as expressing the same necessity. In other words, uh, when looking at the measures of the Paris Commune and working class democracy in the Paris Commune as some kind of model for the dictatorship of the proletariat, what Marx observed was that, of course, if the working class were to come to power and try to implement socialism, it would be faced with the necessities that exist under capitalism. In other words, the dictatorship of the proletariat is the dialectical opposite, but also the continuation of Bonapartism, of capitalist statism. It does take over state capitalism in this respect. The problem is, is that the left might not recognize that as the problem, but might see that somehow as the solution. Right? So 
Uh, Marx had an idea of false necessity, ideology being the affirmation of a false necessity. A false necessity is not simply a necessity that is wrong or doesn't exist, or a particular interest, like that of the capitalist class, but it's a necessity of society that has to be overcome. All right, so the necessity of capitalism, the necessity of capital accumulation, the necessity of statism in capitalism is a real necessity, but it's a real necessity that we ought not to accept and naturalize, but see as the problem to be overcome. And that's the way Marx understood the dictatorship of the proletariat. It's another, you know, dictatorship of the proletariat, Bonapartism, these are extremely exotic concepts that don't uh, necessarily mesh with common sense uh, in terms of, you know, our, our kind of uh, working class sensibilities in capitalism. Nonetheless, they're really crucial. And um, I'll just point out that uh, Marx did not invent the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat that came from uh, Blanqui and the Blanquists. And yet he accepted that a real recognition had been had in terms of what it would take to overcome capitalism. So that's, that's the way that I would answer the, the question of Paris Commune and, um, and also Marx's critique of the Paris Commune. Meaning he did see it as a step in the right direction, but he also thought that it embodied a certain problem. And instead, I think that the left does do what Ralph pointed out and also what, um, what uh, Matt has also pointed out, which is that um, they make a virtue of necessity and they celebrate things like a kind of ancient model of democracy and the unification of executive and legislative power. In the United States, that's compounded because in the United States, the left tends to admire Western Europe. That has parliamentary government that tends to unify the executive and the legislative and to see that as better, progressive, more socialistic. Right. So that's, that would be the danger, is that um, we're, we're very much aware of Marx's critique of anarchism. What we forget is Marx's critique of state socialism, and indeed Marx's endorsement of anarchism as against state socialism. He, he only thought that the problem with the anarchists is that they, quote unquote, had no theory, meaning they had no, no, no understanding of the necessity of the problem that they sought to overcome. They just thought it was like a bad idea. The state is just this bad thing, rather than understanding where it actually came from. OK, let's take another question. Um, yeah, let's do it. Efrain, can, can you go to um, And just so everyone is aware, it's 7.30, and we're supposed to be scheduled to end around now. But since we started a bit late, uh, we're going to be going over a little bit so we can get some questions in. Um, just a quick note on the Paris Commune. I think one thing that's forgotten and maybe you come up when we discussed it last night as well, in terms of the split within the first international, is that before the Marxists and the anarchists split, the British trade unionists walked out, having supported the first address in favour of the first republic declaration in 1870 and then opposing the third address, Marxist third address. And in a way, I think that raises the issue of liberal democracy um, and labor and like labor politics as opposed to revolution. Um, so I think that's important to kind of remember. Um, but I, I wanted to ask a question. This, this panel weirdly feels very similar to me to the opening plenary we had at the 2016 convention on international social democracy. It had very similar kind of range of speakers, one of whom is here in the audience, Jack Ross, um, who said on that panel something on the lines of, say what you will, but we've forgotten the positive elements of anti-communism. And it was a kind of peculiar historical statement, but I wanted to recall it now. I think one of the questions that's coming up about necessity and objectivity of political forms is the question of whether certain things are necessarily reproduced by bourgeois society and capitalism, and whether they can, or whether they can be forgotten. And 
it seems like the question of the crisis of liberal democracy as it's posed by a contemporary moment is, are we going, are we heading to a non-liberal form of democracy or are we heading to a liberal form of non-democracy? And it feels like on the one hand we might say democracy as the political expression of the commodity form is spontaneously reproduced by capitalism but that liberal values, the kinds of separations of power that Chris was discussing, can be forgotten, that are a kind of subjective historical consciousness that actually can fade away. On the other hand, it might seem that in bourgeois society, it's these kind of liberal concerns that will spontaneously be reproduced, and democracy that can be done away with, and there are all kinds of, you know, if you read the Financial Times, there are all these polls about how young people no longer want democracy or care about democracy. Um, so what of these, like how do you understand the question of are we heading to a non-liberal democracy or a democratic non-liberal society? And what about these ideas can be forgotten and what about them are going to re reproduce anyway whether we forget them or not? Um, ourselves, like as a form of historical consciousness. Right. So I I enjoy the um, the articulation of like a a liberal form of non democracy. Right. I think when we talk about liberal values and historical time that they manifest in. It was a time within capitalist development where the competition stage was still kind of the dominant trend. Uh, and when it came to forming nation states, cooperation on some quote unquote democratic basis was kind of the ruling idea. Um, the capitalists wanted to cooperate with each other to kind of have a stable economy. And so this is where a lot of the, you know, um, ideas of like democracy equality uh, before the law um, and um, freedom of speech and things like that come. But now, you know, hundreds of, uh, hundred, oh, well over a century later, we are in a different stage of capitalism. We are in a later stage of capitalism imperialism. We are in a later stage of capitalist imperialist conflict. We are in a stage where um, socialist uh, states have already come and gone, but the ideas of socialism definitely live on all over the world and the threat of socialism and the necessity to quell political dissent is kind of built into these capitalist states that remain, right? We see erosion of these liberal ideas of equality as capitalism progresses towards uh, what is being kind of described as bonapartism or consolidation of power and um, unification of the executive and the legislative. Uh, we see erosions of these ideas because they don't serve the bourgeoisie at this stage. They are weaponized, um, I think, as Matt advocates that we do, kind of to reclaim these ideas of liberty and democracy, they've been weaponized by the people that they intend to oppress. They are not, they're almost dangerous to give these ideas to the people. It is dangerous to kind of open up the avenue for people to express themselves uh, democratically, to really express any freedoms. These are threats to capitalism, imperialism as it exists today. So yes, we can definitely move towards a non-democratic forms of capitalism that have, that reject, you know, some of the basic tenets of liberalism simply because at this stage of things, they, they very well do not represent what the bourgeoisie wants, what they need to proliferate ideologically in order to survive, to maintain their existence, right? Um, I think when we see kind of even a, a wild example of like celebrities where we deify them, we deify their abilities, we deify the way that they're naturally better or that they deserve whatever they got, right? We have a society that like constantly advocates all thought and reason towards uh, these unnamed, often unnamed experts or these statistics, right? Where we want people to kind of abdicate their power and their agency, right? Because these are ideas that serve the needs of the capitalist class and they are evolving past what was originally laid out with, within liberal doctrines. So yes, capitalism remains liberalism as, as it was, right, can absolutely transform into something that really is completely alien to any principle of egalitarianism or democracy or freedom. Um, and I don't think that such concepts of liberalism are necessary 
are necessarily reproduced by capitalism, capitalism because capitalism as it was is not capitalism as it is now, and the evolutions that we are seeing are uh, quite unfortunately undemocratic, which is why I maintain the necessity of the proletarian class taking this into their own hands, right, but also having the social practices, the organizations that manifest those ideas in reality, and not trying to force the bourgeoisie to adopt them or to act upon them, because if it doesn't serve them, they won't. They won't even open the avenue. We have to open the avenue within ourselves. So um, I definitely appreciate that question. It's a very interesting idea. Yeah, great question. Uh, and actually, since we're coming to a close, I think it's a really good one to end on also. Uh, so. I would argue following Frederick Jameson, right, that we are in the middle of a postmodern cultural moment where one of the primary sources of enemy and alienation is the feeling on the part of many ordinary people that they have no historical role to play, that ultimately things simply are as they are and there's nothing you can do to change them. Uh, and there's a lot of empirical evidence to back up that this is the way people feel. Uh, so eat well and good uh, in the United States, who are too conservative, or sorry, United Kingdom, too conservative political scientists claimed that the primary motivation behind people voting for Brexit and voting for the Conservative Party was their feeling that fundamentally uh, Britain was in the hand of economic elites uh, and that ordinary people had no say uh, and that Brexit, regardless of whether or not they were actually ideologically committed to it, at least constituted a break uh, from this order. Uh, it was a way of giving the middle finger uh, to what they took to be the globalist internationalist elites. Here in, this own, uh, in, our, uh, in the United States, uh, Martin Gillis conducted a very long study, publishes Affluence and Influence, uh, where he pointed out that the average citizen also feels like they have no say in how they are governed, that generally speaking, um, the powers that be work in the interests of economic elites. And the most damning part of the study is that he pointed out it's absolutely true, right? The average citizen in the United States has almost no impact uh, on public policy. But if you do become rich enough, you do actually have an impact on public policy. And the richer you become, the more likely it is that you are to see your interests uh, instantiated into law. And as a result of this postmodern sense of anomie uh, about being unable to reshape history, we've seen an enormous number uh, of new proposals put forward about how to break the gridlock of history that we seem to be in. And the fortunate reality is that many of the ones that seem to be the most appealing to people at this point are fundamentally reactionary or right-wing viewpoints. So this is where I want to reiterate my point, which is that there's nothing coextensive about the political right and bourgeois or liberal values. Uh, there are far worse things that the political right wants for the world and for American society uh, than liberal democracy. Uh, and this goes all the way back to the 18th century when many reactionaries and many conservatives were profoundly antagonistic to the emergence of even limited Republican democracy, precisely because they saw this as an advance on the part of the crass and the venal uh, over and against the sublime rulers uh, who were ordained by God to be the masters of the universe, as it were. In terms of the contemporary projects that the political right is trying to advance, that they see uh, as an alternative to the liberal or the neoliberal status quo, there are usually three countries that are singled out as candidates uh, for our future. The first one is Hungary, right, which many people probably have noted, uh, tends to be an object of enormous fetish uh, for many people on the American right especially. You know, Tucker Carlson did a slavish uh, tour of Budapest uh, where he paid his acquiescence and dues to Orban. And there's a lot of reasons why conservatives like Hungary, right? Uh, Orban initially claimed that what he was trying to produce is, as it called it, an illiberal democracy in 2014. Uh, but we've very clearly seen since then that with the death of liberalism in Hungary, we're also increasingly seeing the death of democracy. Uh, quite literally, every political faction in the country allied to try to oust Orban in the last election, uh, and they were completely unsuccessful, right? Uh, Orban was reelected. Uh, because he has a grip on the media, he has a grip on the courts, uh, he's banished many uh, ac academics and intellectuals who don't agree with him, uh, and it's very unlikely that Fidesz uh, is going to disappear anytime soon, unless it's unable to deliver the economic goods. The second object, uh, country that's an object of fetish uh, for many on the political right now is uh, Javier Millet's uh, Argentina, right? Uh, many people find this unusual uh, because many on the American right now seem to have this kind of status inclination to them. Uh, but I think Bronze Age pervert, uh, who's a major intellectual on the right right now, put it very well, uh, where he said, the reason why many rightists like Millet uh, is because Millet was fundamentally committed to this idea uh, that Argentina had become a basket case uh, because women, LGBTQ people, the poor, uh, had been given an enormous amount of say for a long period of time. And fundamentally, what Millet was doing was giving those people the middle finger and allowing the productive people uh, in Argentinian society to reclaim control of the state. Uh, and in this sense, there's 
potential for anarcho-libertarian uh, or right-wing forms of libertarianism to regain ground here in the US and other countries because there's no doubt that this has a lot of appeal to many of the political right. And then the last country that's a pro a very much a fetish object for people right now uh, is of course our good friend Russia, right? Uh, so Russia, uh, of course, uh, is dominated by an autocratic, nationalist, nominally religious leader uh, who has very, very capably uh, decided to weaponize the language of anti-wokeism to appeal to a large audience on the American and Western right. Uh, he is also very much uh, aligned with the most plutocratic forces in the country that emerged in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union. And so surprised uh, that Tucker Carlson uh, also obsequiously just did a tour of Russia recently and tried to interview Putin because there's a lot for people on the American right to find appealing there. It's authoritarianism, it's anti-democracy, it's emphasis on extraordinary amounts of wealth, uh, it's revanchist Christian nationalism, uh, it's imperialism. Now I'm not sure which of these alternative anti-liberal postmodernities are eventually going to carry the day on the right or whether some combination of them are going to. Uh, but I just want to stress that compare again to any of these options, liberal democracy as it stands right now looks a hell of a lot better to me, even if we absolutely need to push it imminently in the direction of a much more democratic and socialist future. Um, now, this, despite the fact that what may emerge is uh, what's it, a illiberal democracy or a uh, undemocratic liberalism. Um, I don't think I don't think the 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 fire of the you know the flame of liberty is going to die anytime soon. I don't think like the sub, the consciousness of these ideas is going to die out because of the fact that in in the even in the twenty first century so far, whether it's the Arab Spring or other similar protest movements that people went out into the streets and mobilized for, you know, they weren't mobilizing for abolition, abolishing the commodity form or the dictatorship of the proletariat, but for, to put it, you know, like this, like, liber give me liberty or give me death. And they were mobilizing for, broadly speaking, these liberal bourgeois ideals, right? And so in that sense that uh, these values aren't going to die out any time um, um, soon. Optimism at Electives Conference, that's one. <laughs> well, I opened up in, in my presentation saying, you know, there's, there's a struggle over democracy. And the question, I think, is where is it headed? And what, made, what that made me think about was a problem in Europe and the United States, at least, and that is the erosion of independent civic institutions and mass parties of the left. Uh, instead of people being educated and socialized and connected to other people at the grassroots level, they're atomized and getting messaged by political elites. It used to be TV primarily, now it's social media. Um, and so, you know, there, there was a political scientist who's passed on now, wrote a book on political parties, Arthur Lippo, and he, he talked about plebiscitory democracy, like referendums, where they're very easily manipulated from the top down, unless you've got mediating institutions, like trade unions, like lodges, like veterans organizations. I'm a Vietnam veteran, I belong to Vietnam Veterans Against the War, and also the American Legion. And American Legion's having trouble just keeping, the old, getting young people involved, the older people, it's social. Um, but you see that all across, and that opens the door for, uh, I guess, you, what do you call it, a uh, liberal form of non-democracy? You know, nominal elections, but it's manipulated from the top down nominal rights to do things, but not organizations who wish to do them. Which for me, I think, and I'll wrap up with this, I think the left in Europe, the socialist and communist parties and some of these new left parties, they turn toward the professional middle class with the whole neoliberal movement and pissed off the working class. And they've lost it. And a lot of those people are going with right-wing populists. We've seen a similar phenomenon here, but I think 
the post 60s left. Like 1970s, a watershed in how these civic organizations disappeared. There's a political scientist whose name is skipping me. She did a whole study of it. She's at Harvard. You, somebody probably knows who I'm talking about. But, uh, you know, it's really eroded. And I'm just old enough, having come up in the 50s and 60s, and, you know, being taken to, you know, Masonic Lodge events and veterans organization events and trade union meetings by that generation which hasn't happened in the post 60s generation. Um, and I think the left here made a decision that uh, because we were successful with street politics, getting civil rights and voting rights and stopping the war in Vietnam, that's all we needed. We didn't need organization. We didn't need a political party. And of course, you know, my argument is, you know, we were the world's su second superpower opposing the war in Iraq, according to the New York Times mass demonstrations. And you know what happened? Most of the Democrats just took us for granted and voted for Bush's war in Congress. So um, I guess that's an argument for we need a mass party on the left. And it's something that's eroded in Europe and we kind of turned away from in the post 60s, the 60s generation going afterwards. And I think that leads us to a point where, you know, it threatens democracy. You know, the kind of democracy where people are educated and can participate and associate horizontally, not just get messages from the top down. So I want to say something about like liberalism because I think that, um, you know, I emphasized in my opening remarks uh, civil liberties um, and the rights of the individual, the rights of minorities. Um, but I, I, what came up also in the discussion uh, is civil society in the state. Uh, so a court, part of liberalism is the idea that you need civil society to have rights against the state. And so that's not merely a matter of individuals or even minorities, it's a, it's a matter of society as such. So when we think about like illiberal democracy or um, uh, liberalism without democracy, the missing piece with those, because those tend to be like principles, you know, principles of liberalism, principles of democracy is civil society, the substance of civil society. So many years ago, um, I wrote something that I presented at the Left Forum in New York on Lenin's liberalism. And there I didn't emphasize the question of uh, political pluralism in terms of political, multiple political parties. I did bring it up, the fact that the uh, October Revolution in Russia was actually a two or three party revolution. It wasn't a unitary party wasn't a one-party revolution. It was the left SRs, the Bolsheviks, and then you could say Trotsky and his Mensheviks were the left of the Mensheviks, and that they joined the Bolsheviks, but basically they were another party. Um, but I emphasized, rather, uh, the non-identity of the working class, the masses, the state, and the party. And that's exactly what got collapsed in, uh, in the name of the struggle for socialism under the rubric of Stalinism. So, you know, we can say the need for a movement, the need for a party. Uh, one of the things that is observed in capitalist politics, like not on the left, but more generally, we could say in the center of capitalist politics, is how the parties themselves have become hollowed out. In other words, the parties themselves lack a social base that there's a kind of hollowing out of democracy at the level of the substance of politics. That it is publicitory, it is uh, the primary system for selecting candidates in the United States that the Democrats and the Republicans use, is an alternative to the smoke-filled back rooms where they used to choose their candidates that way, and that in fact that might have been more democratic than the primary system in which it just is a matter of who has the most money to uh, put out the greatest amount of advertising and do the most uh, polling and market research in support of candidates. So certainly a socialist party um, would have to have a civil social component and that's where I wanted to you know, uh, maybe bring up another point, which is that political parties can be misunderstood. I think that in the recent millennial left with the DSA in particular in the United States, but also with uh, momentum in the UK around Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party. I think that uh, 
younger people, and generally speaking, when they hear political party, they only hear an electoral party. They only hear a ballot line. Right? They don't hear something more thoroughly organized. Um, and again, the specter there, it's a different specter than uh, you know, the state socialism or state capitalism or whatever you want to call it in the Soviet Union, in China, and other countries. Um, the specter of the party, the specter of a party that has this control over civil social organization. So on the left, you hear a lot about, uh, there was a critique of my book from last year on the death of the millennial left written by Alex Ochili um, in American Affairs, where he said, well, Chris Catron doesn't uh, reckon with the decline of associationism you call the decline of associationism. I'm not so sure, meaning there might have been a decline of associationism, so to speak, on the left, but on the right it seems to be alive and well. Um, in other words, uh, I mean, I guess more recently there's been a decline in church attendance on the part of religious people. Who knows what that's about? But at least for a time in the neoliberal era, it was the religion, the, the religious right, and maybe religion more generally, that actually picked up the slack in civil society. And we tend to ignore that on the left. Um, and so it's not that it's not happening at all, but it's happening in certain ways. So it might not have happened in the traditional leftist ways, but that doesn't mean it was disappearing in society as a whole. Because uh, sometimes, you know, I, I will definitely be, be one to point out, you know, we need more civil social organizing on the left and people will treat that as a non-starter, or you know, where do you even begin with that? And the model that I always have in the back of my head is uh, religious organizations, which have thrived in the last 50 years and not simply declined as other earlier civil social institutions did. And we should remember that labor unions way back in the day, in the early 19th century, they tended to have a religious basis. That's where they came from. Let's just take a last question here. And so if uh, the panelists can um, use this last opportunity to say, wrap up your thoughts, your final remarks, um, this is how we'll do it. Okay, please do. Um, I'd just like to thank the panelists for their presentations and also just pick up on a few threads that's continued to come out throughout this panel and hopefully tie them together. So my question is, um, why does it seem that even much of the self-avowed socialist left has taken up the defense of what they believe to be liberal democracy against the threat of right-wing populism, which we have heard several of the panelists um, defend? And is that a break from the history of the left? If so, why did this happen? And following on all of that, could the current continuous crisis of liberal democracy be not just an expression of the crisis of capitalism, um, but on the left's past failures to overcome capitalism, not just in the organizational sense, but increasingly in its in inability to understand the forms and problems of society? Sorry, that's a bit of a doozy. Uh, Okay, if you could, if you could please reiterate that last section of the question. Okay, yeah, sorry, I spoke a bit fast. Um, could the current continuous crisis of liberal democracy be not just an expression of the crisis of capitalism, but on the left's past failures to overcome capitalism, not just organizational, but not just organizational speaking? Um, but increasingly with its inability to understand the forms and problems of society. Okay, so I think within the Maoist revolutionary left, we see a big division of how you can handle, or handle the question of participation or non-participation in bourgeois elections, right? I think when you look to the revolutionary camp in the Philippines where they, the, uh, the Communist Party actively holds liberated zones. They defend indigenous land through armed struggle. The mass space for the new democratic movement contains millions of organizers, right? And the struggle for uh, liberation from American imperialism and a new democracy, right, is kind of the mass space. Um, you see huge, huge divisions and huge problems about how they handle electoral processes. Um, I think on the front of the, the Filipino party, they skew what is considered to be right on this question, and they're very openly, from party leadership, interested in taking preference in political leaders participating in elections. They voted against Marcos, and they argue that at certain times, this is a, uh, 
allowed them to avoid certain negative changes in the overall um, development of Filipino society. It has allowed them to negotiate for the release of political prisoners, and it uh, helps them not become isolated, right, from the masses of people who are interested in these questions about how um, they can improve their lives through reforms. This is how they told the line between reforms and reformism. That was their position. You look over across the world to South American parties, particularly uh, the Peruvian party from 1968 to 1980s, right? The, you see in South America a lot of socialist governments already in power, a lot of them cooperating with American imperialism and in the uh, Maoist conceptions over there, they reaching the limits of democratic socialism. And so you see um, the Communist Party of Peru take a very anti-electoralist stance. They think it is a, not just a tactic, but a principle to reject participation in elections. And then you come back to the middle, uh, middle, I guess, and you uh, take the Maoist Party of India, also controlling liberated zones, also having mass spaces of organizers in the millions, right? They take somewhere uh, in the middle, where they say within the liberated zones, in the places where the armed struggle is in a position to take power, you boycott the elections. Not only do you boycott them, but you disrupt them. You show the uh, enemy state that they cannot govern this land and they will not participate in your process. However, in the other regions of the nation where the party is weak, we do not bother with that question. We let people do vote if they want to vote and don't vote if you don't want to vote, right? But the, our line on this is relative to our strength to realize proletarian power. And it is um, relative, essentially, but they, on the whole, do not have preferences for leaders. Uh, uh, and they don't participate in elections, but they do kind of have silence on allowing the people to vote while they agitate them for revolution, organize them for revolution. My attitude in the United States. Um, I have complete sympathy with the people who prefer Biden to Trump. I, I guess my position in the United States is something towards uh, the, the Indian uh, party, where it's like, I don't, I'm not gonna vote. I don't think people um, need to vote. I don't think non-voting is a means to an end. It isn't, right? But I, don't think, uh, I think as Chris said, Trump is kind of a centrist and a, 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 a conservative in his politics. I don't think the difference between Biden and Trump and how they govern is that substantial. I think the circus is different, absolutely. Uh, but the actual results here are, are, are minimal. They, are, they govern very much the same. Bourgeois uh, interests get fulfilled one way or the other. The parties are increasingly aligned on how they govern, but they just represent very different groups of people um, ideologically in America. And that's the difference we got to really capitalize on. Because I understand where that uh, like sentiment comes from, right? I. I understand why they feel so strongly that you must vote for Biden as a lesser evil. It's not, I don't think, a good tactic for the revolution to say, no, you shouldn't vote, right? Like, no, you shouldn't do this. You should just let them. If that is where their consciousness leads them, go ahead and vote. Because I'm not gonna sit here and argue that not voting is gonna like further the revolution right now. It isn't. Um, but I am saying- Just for like a bit more clarification, I would like to ask, um, in terms of like the people, um, Sorry. Um, in terms of the people, the um, um, struggle against like right wing populism, how is that different from in the history of like from the uh, Western or uh, American leftists? And why specifically do you think that happened, especially with Trump? Is Trump himself special or has the left simply um, changed their view or have they not changed their view at all um, in the US, of course? I don't. I think Trump is special in that he, uh, as one person, embodies right-wing populist sentiment. I think right-wing populist sentiment has been on the rise for decades and decades, and he's just the latest iteration of it, especially post-2008. Um, and it, 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 you're asking if this is like an error on the left, uh, or represents like a difference in our approach? So is there a difference? Uh has the left always struggled in this way against right-wing populism? And if, if not, 
Um, or if so, then like why has it changed, or why, why or why do you think it, it, it's intensified via uh, through in the recent era? Please repeat it with a microphone oh. for the recording. Sorry. Um, can someone else repeat it? I'm kind of scared. Um, so basically, um, how has the Trump era differed from the uh, way the left in the U.S. has? previously engaged with uh, opposing right-wing populism? Um, if it has, why? And um, if it hasn't, then why has it intensified so and taken on a seemingly new character under Trump? I think Trump represents an era where we care a lot more about social issues and uh, social liberation-like fronts than we have before. Um, I think issues of like women's rights, queer liberation, um, you know, anti-immigrant sentiments, they've activated two sections of the left because these are all now concretely left ideas. Um, the left looks different than it has before. It cares about a variety of social tasks and their ideological and political underpinnings in a way that is new, right? And so I think Trump enrages huge sections of people in a way that where his sentiments probably kind of, like, he has the, he has the same social sentiments as like Reagan. And uh, Reagan's like misogyny, his anti-gay rhetoric was not the activating forces um, for the entirety of the left. It definitely was for some, but I think in the area of Trump, we see a qualitative difference in how these things activate people. Um, I do think the left has organized against populist, the populist right before. Uh, they have failed many times, I think, because it has allowed them to make concessions to bourgeois elections, especially like in the New Deal um, or the fight for civil rights uh, that has, you know, we, we, people settled for um, reforms and it kind of allowed the revolutionary movement to be crushed. Um, and I think we need to change our approach and really grasp a more scientific uh, understanding about where the relationship between social issues and class issues align. And because they are deeply interrelated, but they are not on the same level. I think from class issues, we see social issues arise. We see social issues arise from the economic base and the politi uh, economic political organization of our society. And grasping those issues better will lead us away from reformism. It will lead us towards a uh, revolutionary practice. And I think because social issues are so deeply entwined with well, uh, how we conceive of democracy, how we conceive of liberation today, really. Um, focusing on some ideological development on the front and the limitations of these elections uh, and the, in my opinion, un, like, unsevere differences between Trump and Biden and not pouring all of our energy into um, electoral politics. That is just not the immediate task for the revolutionaries right now. I think if, even if reform is not a bad, um, in, itself, in and of itself is not an error, it is an error to focus entirely on that, or to make that the main arena of our struggle. Um, so I guess that is how I think we should move forward with this election year. Yeah. Just, just let me just say, we, could, we have 10 minutes left in this room, so just keep that in mind. OK, I'll do my best to be brief. Uh, Sorry about that. That's fine. Uh, so um, I think that it's important to stress that there's without a doubt a continuity between Trump and other faith, uh, like um, other forces on the American right uh, over the course of its history. I'm not one of those who can persist with this idea that there's a discontinuity between Trumpism uh, and say Reaganism or Nixonism. However, uh, I do think that there's a qualitative shift that has been enacted under Trumpism. Uh, Austin Walsh actually wrote a very good book about this recently, uh, which is that the American Republican Party has risen from being a conservative party that tolerated and sometimes actively cooperated with far right elements to a far-right party that is actively cooperating and sometimes is willing to tolerate conservative elements. And that is a very foundational shift in some respects. And it is important not to underestimate how dangerous this could be in the event that Trump is able to take power again. I think that there's this temptation on the part of the left to always underestimate the appeal uh, of a right populist message, precisely because to many of us it seems fundamentally so toxic. But there's a deep root. Uh, of right-wing populism in this country that has always been extremely pervasive. This goes back to the Civil War, when prior to the Civil War, uh, when many American slavers were desperately concerned about abolitionism uh, and its encroachment in the South, what they did was release a series of pamphlets by people like Senator Townsend saying, listen, if you are a white person in the American South, yes, you may not have any material wealth. 
Yes, you might not actually be able to own slaves, but you are still kind of aristocrat uh, because you're able to sit at the master's table, the master will call you by name, and you always know who will be available to wash your shoes or clean your boots uh, when you ask them to. Trumpism offers something very similar contemporaneously. The left fundamentally is offering people a society that is committed to equality, freedom, and dignity for all on a basis of a kind of democratic sensibility. What right-wing populists offer people is oftentimes considerably more attractive, at least to our more vulgar instincts, which is this idea that you are a dispossessed aristocrat or elite, a winner in Trumpist parlance, uh, and it is only because these decadent leftists, minorities, and unworthy groups uh, that you have been dispossessed of your inheritance. And for many people, this idea that you are a dispossessed aristocrat or elite who is taking back your country is obviously going to be massively more appealing than the idea that you are an equal to somebody that you fundamentally do not want to regard as an equal. So we cannot underestimate, to my mind, the threat of a far-right party with conservative elements in it, because it absolutely could win power in this country and enact fundamental structural reforms uh, that would encroach on the, admittedly, the limited achievement of liberal democracy in a way that I don't think is acceptable. So very obviously, I think that the left or socialist left should be very much against right-wing populism and, and um, should be <coughs> because they are not good for you know society and they are you know Trump is a symptom of a much deeper um, political and social crisis that's been going on for ages. So it's not like he came out of the blue. But the difference is with, you know, other more progressive liberal oppositions to Trump is it should be more consistent with the abuses that Trump does when, say, other political forces like the Democrat Party or whatever do the same thing. So it shouldn't be hypocritical in that sense. So and that's why, you know, right wing populism isn't good for either liberal democracy or for socialism. Well, I see Trump as a manifestation of politics that's been around a long time. The, the Dixiecrats, the racists, mm -hmm. the bigots, the people that scapegoat minorities to mobilize their people who feel minorities might be encroaching on their privileges. Now, it used to be a huge portion of the electorate. Nixon and Wallace combined got over 60% of the vote in 1968. And Nixon was dog whistling and Wallace was whistling a little bit louder, but uh, still a little bit of dog whistles, like, like Trump, which almost, he almost says the quiet part out loud and sometimes does. Um, but I think demographically, that cohort is dying out. The younger people are much more tolerant in terms of issues of race and gender and, uh, you know, social orientation. So, um, but I think, you know, there's nothing special about Trump. He just uh, remember, he came, people came to him after Obama had been president, and those people that didn't like that because he's black had somebody to vote for, Trump. And you can see what it is. It's about a third of the electorate, and the rest of the Republican vote is country club Republicans that don't want to pay taxes. I think that's it. Um, it's a minority. It should be beat. You know, just if people vote for what they believe in, uh, question, well, I'm going to get into uh, prognosticating on this election, because there's a lot to say. Um, but I guess uh, you, you have for closing comment, uh, a mass membership party of the left. I mean, I think that's the missing thing in, in, in left politics, particularly in this country. That was an invention of the socialist workers movement in the 19th century in order to compete with the top-down parties of landed and, and uh, business elites. Uh, and in most countries got it, we didn't. And maybe the Socialist Party for a few decades was a good example of that, but for a lot of reasons that didn't stick around. Um, as opposed to a Vanguard Party, which I think the logic there is the Vanguard knows better, and if the people don't do what they say, there's repression. That's the one party state. And also opposed to the Democrats and Republicans, which are memberless parties. You don't have any particular rights in your party except to vote for a state-run primary, you don't go to the local chapter of the Democratic or Republican Party to deal with local issues. They don't exist. They don't meet for that reason. They just meet to do nominations and then mobilize 
uh, people to vote for them or to get the petitions done. So to me, that's been missing on the left since, you know, in the late 60s when we, you know, a few of us anyway, the Peace and Freedom Party, the People's Party, the Citizen Party, and the Green Party, the Labor Party, I mean, we just haven't been able to do it. Uh, and that comes back to electoral reform that I talked about at the beginning, that that single member district winner take all system forces most progressive minded people to feel like you gotta vote for the Democrats to stop those Trump Republicans. And the left has no voice in that process. So we gotta, gotta reform the electoral process. Okay. All right, um, I'm just gonna speak totally anecdotally because I think that um, uh, with, re with regards to the election that's coming up, um, you know, I think it's remarkable that Trump could win, um, given everything that's stacked against him. And I'll just, uh, again, from personal anecdote, I'll make reference to my own family. So I'm from a working class background. My family is working class. Uh, my, my grandparents were all four unionized workers. My parents, uh, my mother at least, was a unionized worker for many years. My brother and his wife are unionized workers. Um, they voted for Obama twice, and they voted for Trump twice. And they'll vote for Trump a third time. They're the so-called Reagan Democrats. They're the swing voters. Those are the people who will decide the election. And um, they would definitely be considered racist by the woke people, but they're not at all racist. Um, meaning they would you know, not pass muster in academia or in uh, corporate kind of HR speak. Um, but they're not at all racist in any way. And uh, now, at the same time, I'm not gonna claim any great progress on that front because I've, I've lived long enough to actually see society become appreciably less racist and to see it sort of backtrack and to see a kind of return and a potential retrenchment of racism, at least in certain milieus. I think it's a divided phenomenon. Um, I think, uh, you know, so the narrative that Trump represents the Dixiecrats. Um, I think that that is basically the Democratic Party narrative. Um, and I, I don't think that that really serves us very well. I will also point out, uh, in a class stratified way, um, racism is quite a differential phenomenon. So the rates of uh, interracial marriage, much higher in the working class than in the middle class. That's significant. So the middle class view that the left tends to have is a very distorted view of society. To come back to the question of, do we even know what society is, right? So if the left is socialist and claims to represent society, it does not, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I know that as an academic now, as a professor, I live in an entirely alien environment. Meaning, How could you talk about Trump representing society if you didn't even win the popular vote? I'm not saying that. I'm saying he could win this election and the basis of... Your the... votes don't matter. It's fake. Please, let's I just guess it let is the fake. speaker finish. Sure. Um, but, okay, so you want the other prognosis. The other prognosis is Trump could win the election and the Democrats are going to take it to the brink in terms of a constitutional crisis. They're going to do absolutely everything to keep him out of office, and even to the point of provoking a constitutional crisis. So it might be fake, but even the theater can have a breakdown, can have a collapse. And that's going to be significant. That's going to be a significant ideological phenomenon. Is it going to be a significant social phenomenon? Not necessarily, but it's going to be a significant ideological and political phenomenon insofar as political phenomena have any substance whatsoever, very little. A round of applause for him. <laughs>